very afternoon for our Indian colleagues. I am Manel Zataraya from the French Naval Academy and will be sharing three hours to discuss this afternoon issues about marine science and technology. And as it was mentioned in the program, this session will be continuing. May I ask all the people to mute their microphones, please? Uh, and the uh, session will continue, as I mentioned, in the afternoon. Uh, sorry, tomorrow after, morning or afternoon. To <clears throat> begin, let me share some thoughts with you about the Indo-French cooperation in marine science and technology. There have been many uh, cooperations between India and France in the past, but nothing really formalized since June 2018 when uh, in the meeting of Science and Technology Committee, marine science was first introduced. And followed the next year, we had a round table during the French tour in Cochin to prepare Knowledge Summit 2. In Knowledge Summit 1, there was no marine science at all. And finally, in August of the same year, there have been a joint statement during the visit of the Indian Prime Minister to France, which uh, explicitly mentioned the importance of marine science and technology in the Indo-French cooperation and Indo-Pacific uh, region cooperation between our countries. In the previous knowledge summit in uh, Lyon, uh, sorry, in yes, in Lyon, uh, we had the first real discussion about bilateral cooperation. We had recommended some of the area of cooperation, identified few people. And before that knowledge, there had been a visit of Indian delegation to Brest, a six person to discuss marine science and technology. So it is becoming a hot topic. And we have a responsibility in this summit to go ahead and identify areas of cooperation. And that will be done through several presentations. Today we'll have five presentations mainly focused on marine technologies, on observing or exploiting the ocean. Two that are more oceanography oriented and two which are more biology and biodiversity oriented. Tomorrow you will have many more papers on biology, biodiversity, oceanography, plus a specific session on socioeconomic transfer of coastal area. So as you see, we are exploring all the aspects, the science, the technology, and the human impact. To make this run smoothly, uh, I have to give you some instruction given to me. So uh, you are welcome to ask questions through the chat and then the question will be transferred to the uh, speakers. If you are not speaking, please mute your microphone so uh, you are not disturbing the speakers. You can keep your um, uh, camera on if you have enough bandwidth and if you don't want to use the whole bandwidth, you can switch the camera on and please, when uh, you start speaking, don't forget to unmute your microphone. And finally, I would like to remind you that we'll have a round table discussion at the end. So that's a, uh, important. I think uh, uh, discussions are even more important than presentation. And before we start, I would like to share two uh, dates with you there where we could meet again physically. Just to remind you to save the date that the IEEE Ocean Conference will take place in Chennai this year, and that will be in February 21 to 24. And it is organized by NIOT and by IIT Madras. That will be a first place where we could uh, meet and discuss our uh, topics of interest. And the second date I wanted to save is the CTEC week which will take place in September 2022. 
and this CTEC week, uh, this year, the uh, uh, guest country is India, and we are working hard with uh, several ministries of India, Ministry of Science, Technology, Earth Science, Human Resources and Development, and the Ministry of Port, Shipping and Waterway. And as you see, the major topic is marine transport towards motor and greener solution. And uh, of course, you are welcome to contribute and to participate and hope we'll have a big Indian delegation. And this is done in cooperation between the Indian uh, embassy in France and the French embassy in India, as you could imagine. So that's all for in the introduction. I will stop sharing my screen and I will give the floor to um, Dr. Ramadas, who is the director of NIOT, National Institute of Technology in Chennai or Madras, and who will talk to us about technology for future exploration and harvesting of ocean resources. So Dr. Uh, Ramadas, the floor is yours. I will switch off my mic, as I mentioned, and, and you can switch on. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, uh, based on your location. Uh, at the outset, uh, uh, I would like to congratulate the organizers uh, of this knowledge summit uh, for the splendid job they are doing. And I also thank the chair, uh, Professor Zakaria, Professor Kartik Shankar, and Dr. Jaipert. Uh, with the indulgence of all of you, I would like to slightly deviate from my talk and start talking about general ocean resources. Uh, I would be specifically talking about the uh, mineral resources of the ocean. And, uh, and now I'll try to share my presentation. Um, Please acknowledge whether you can see this. Uh, is it okay. Good? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So the title of my talk is uh, Development of the Technology for the Exploration and Harvesting of uh, Deep Ocean Minerals. As Professor Zakaria was kind enough to mention, I'm the Director of the National Institute of Ocean Technology. Uh, it's an autonomous body under the Ministry of Earth Sciences. Um, about a, a very brief mention about the National Institute of Ocean Technology. Our mandate is to design, develop, and demonstrate technologies for exploration and harvesting the non-living and living resources. We uh, use the word harvesting very consciously. We don't want to use the word exploitation. Uh, these are our trust areas. We work on non-living resources, living resources, and then observations and operations. We have got strong group working on uh, uh, living resources as well. And we have got a very good infrastructure and expertise uh, to support our activities. Uh, with this, this is the outline of my talk. First, I will be mentioning a brief history of what we are talking about. Then I'll be talking about the deep, different kinds of deep ocean minerals, how they are surveyed and how the abundance is estimated and how, what technology is developed, what is the scenario of the world. And uh, as a case study, I will take up uh, our own efforts in India uh, about what we have developed uh, for the exploration and harvesting of the deep ocean minerals. Then uh, so there will be some uh, suggestions about the future work, and then it will be followed by the summary. Um, a brief history, as we know that this uh, mineral distribution is highly uneven. Some of the poorest continents and the countries may have the, uh, the richest uh, uh, minerals, like uh, the, are the uh, de deposits of minerals. Uh, but anyway, that is actually the, uh, uh, that's how the uh, coin falls. Okay, then uh, coming to mineral supply and demand, uh, you can see uh, min some of the minerals may last for the centuries like uh, iron, aluminum, uh, chromium, cobalt, and all. But some minerals may last only for a few decades, but some may disappear very soon. So what are the uh, alleviating factors? 
obviously more exploration we can explore for the more minerals at more locations but there is a limit to it because so far only 5% of the earth is available for the exploration tours on uh, like uh, remaining 75% of the earth is actually water and in the 25% of the land we have only 5% available to us for the uh, for habitation and for mining and all so uh, there is a limitation to what you can explore on this earth and then better technology yes of course we can uh, uh, improve our efficiency and also we can uh, uh, regenerate uh, some of the mines that are abandoned earlier for the want of any better technology and finally we can even reclassify the uh, uh, resources to reserve previously resources they were but now they can be called reserves as well but there is a limit to all these things so in the light of this one ocean mining looks very imminent question is when not if so uh, there is no unique way of uh, classifying the ocean resources but for my understanding uh, the, this how i classified one is uh, non living and another is living uh, we are not going to talk about living resources today and then the uh, non living again there are renewable sources and there are non renewable sources renewable sources of energy and fresh water on which niot is doing a lot of work under the non renewable there are seabed minerals and dissolved minerals and uh, our today our concentration will be on seabed minerals oh uh, yeah the actually some of you uh, who follow the literature uh, you may be surprised are you, are you uh, in uh, 1870s itself jules uh, verne actually predicted that these minerals are available in the ocean depths so he was right the first part of the sentence is right but the second part that that would be quite easy to exploit that is not really proving to be really prophetic because they are not really very easy to exploit at least as of now so polymetallic nodules were discovered in at the end of 19th century in the kara sea but later uh, this uh, scientific excursions on the hms challenger uh, it uh, it proved that these polymetallic nodules which are rich in copper cobalt nickel and manganese uh, they are uh, found in uh, different uh, ocean depths beyond 4000 meters there are exceptions of course uh, there are uh, they are correct uh, even shallower depths as well so uh, these are the uh, important seabed minerals oil and natural gas diamonds gas hydrates polymetallic nodules cobalt crust and polymetallic sulfides and there are some dissolved minerals which we are not going to talk about so uh, this uh, picture depicts the non living resources that is deep ocean uh, minerals uh, they which occur at different places and uh, you can see at around the uh, Uh, more than 1000 meters water depth 100 meters below the sea floor uh, this gas hydrates which uh, they are actually a, a, a crystal actually uh, uh, it's like ice crystal trapping this methane uh, molecules uh, they are clathrides and they occur uh, uh, it's actually it's called a burning ice actually so it, each cubic meter of uh, this gas hydrate can con uh, contain 163 cubic meters of methane gas if it is potentially tapped it can be the future source of energy uh, for many countries the second important one is a polymetallic nodules which occur beyond 4000 meters water depth uh, in pacific and uh, beyond 5000 meters water depth in indian oceans uh, again cobalt crust um, cobalt crust is not uh, this polymetallic nodules are a 2d mineral and cobalt crust is stuck to the bottom of the sea uh this uh, they are uh, they occur on the uh, sides of the sea mounts and finally uh, polymetallic sulfides which occur at the mid ocean ridges in the hydrothermal vents so uh, as i was explaining this first mineral that is occurring at shallow waters is shallow air waters i mean 1000 meters beyond uh, this is a, a gas hydrates uh In, in india we have done a lot of survey in the both coasts of uh, india and we found that, that these are abundantly available in varying thicknesses and the polymetallic nodules they are uh, rich in cobalt nickel copper and manganese okay uh, they grow very slowly but it and it, it, we cannot use the word exactly harvesting here and the polymetallic sulfides as i told earlier uh um, they occur when the uh, the tectonic plates meets if there is a gap 
and the cold water seeps in, the hot material comes up, and when they meet, a geyser-like system is set up. Uh, India has signed uh, an agree two agreements with uh, uh, International Civil Authority, one for the polymetallic non-dual exploration, and another is for uh, polymetallic sulfide exploration, one at 13 degrees south and another is 26 degrees south, respectively. Uh, so this is the cobalt trust. And this is unlike the polymetallic nodules, which are 2D minerals, which can be picked up easily. These are a bit difficult to harvest. And uh, what are the challenges? Okay, we all know that inner space is more difficult to conquer. And issues involved, we all know that hydrostatic pressures are very high. There is no uh, electromagnetic radiation communication. So we need uh, a specialized techniques for all these things. So uh, what are the important components of the uh, exploration of uh, and harvesting of ocean minerals? First, we have to survey and find out whether minerals are there or not. And we have to sample and understand how abundant they are and what is the grade of the mineral that is available, whether it is what really doing the exploitation. Next is environmental impact study. Uh, any, any mining involves disturbing the environment, no doubt about it, but how we can minimize it, whether we can really uh, mitigate it, uh, whether it is acceptable to the community, the, the environmental community that we have to see. And then we have to do the exploratory mining, then followed by commercial mining. And the closing down operations are equally important as uh, uh, actually the mining operations. So we have to give it a decent uh, uh, closure uh, with minimum environmental degradation. And uh, so how do we survey? There are different types of ways of surveying. One is seismic, acoustic, geophysical, and imaging. Seismic survey is mainly useful for the uh, resources like petroleum and natural gas, gas hydrates and all. I'm not going to concentrate much on that one. Then acoustic, geophysical, and other imaging surveys are required for the event estimating the minerals. As we can see here, basically for the acoustic surveys, we use uh, echo sounders, that is single beam echo sounder, multi beam echo sounders, side scan sponar for imaging, and sub bottom profiler if we want to see what is below the uh, top surface of the ocean bed. So, in oceans, in essence, uh, we use sound to see, but it's not as simple as it sounds. Actually, there are many corrections required for that. So, but how do you take this uh, survey, uh, uh, this uh, that instruments to the bottom? We need vehicles for taking them to the bottom because from 6,000 meters height, uh, means if you operate, the resolution will be very poor. So we need different kinds of uh, uh, vehicles. At NIOT, uh, we use unmanned vehicles for mainly for our work. So far, we have not gone into manned, but we are going to venture into this area very soon. So this is a simple deep tow system where you can just put sen sensors on that and you can just drag it behind a ship with a rope or with an umbilical cable and you can put uh, different kind of surveying instruments on this one. And the next one is remotely operated vehicle uh, where which can actually move around uh, without the help of the ship. It can be lowered with an umbilical cable so it can go around and complete the work and come back. Uh, one good thing is that you can see what you are doing and you can also do some kind of intervention using the robotic comms. Next one is the, uh, but the reach is very limited there because there is a cable which has a high drag and uh, to overcome that one, you can use autonomous systems, uh, which it doesn't have any cable, but it's only pre-programmed and you can get the data back only when and if it comes back. Okay, but then you cannot do any intervention. So, that is actually survey. And for after that, once the presence of the ore is established, then you have to do the sampling. So you use grabs, dredges, and corers. Grab is mainly for, uh, actually the name says it all. It grabs what is there at the bottom. Two buckets are there when you pull a, a, a rope, actually they, it gets closed and it, uh, it actually traps whatever material is available, then you can pull it up. And uh, boomerang grabs are there actually. They, they go with free fall and come back after losing the uh, weight, anchor weight, and they bring the sample along with them. My MIO colleagues, my senior colleagues who are watching this talk uh, can watch for this one. They have done a, a, a really uh, immense work in Indian Ocean uh, using all these techniques. 
and next one is actually dredges it actually dredges it has a heavy metal ring uh, with uh, followed by a, a net like thing which can actually bring out the material which is on the on surface like pebbles and other things but if you want to see how the formation is vertical formation is there and how actually they are distributed vertically then you have to have a core which can penetrate the bottom and we can bring back the samples of course there are different cores like box core uh, uh, this dive core so many things are available actually and later once you know that uh, that actually you have found out that how many kilograms of this is uh, mineral is available per square meter and what is the grade of that mineral then you have to mine it actually so you have to send a machine which is lowered from the mother ship with the umbilical cable preferably and the, it has to uh, walk on the sea bottom but sea bottom can be at this places very very soft 1 or 2 kpa shear strength and maximum 6 to 8 kpa bearing strength so it can be a track vehicle it can be a screwed vehicle or it can be a just a speed or a sled which is dragged from a ship so different countries has have tried different techniques at different times for example korea and china they tried track vehicles and japan tried uh, towed miner in their first versions of the mining machines and okay not only just uh, locomotion but we have to collect what is there otherwise there is no point in sending the mining machine there are active collectors passive collectors which in hydraulics are using the blades or potato harvesting machines these are mainly used for the two dimensional metals and if if the metal can be easily cut there actually so once it is taken it has to be brought back to the surface the simplest thing is having a moving bucket system but it is easier said than done this is mainly used in this in some i think diamond mining and all maybe not not more than 200 meters water depth second one is sending autonomous shuttles still it has not been too successful very much and the most successful one is actually gemonod tripe okay and where there is a riser with umbilical and a hose whether it is rigid or flexible it is actually extended to the sea bottom a mining machine operates at the end of that one it collects the mineral and pumps it to the surface but how do we pump it to the surface there are two ways of doing it either you can do a air so you can send a pressurized rain from the top and that it bubbles and when it bubbles it brings the collected nodules or crushed nodules to that surface but uh, it needs a difficult uh, system to really set up so it may not be really suitable for uh, very high depths the uh, the most uh, widely used one is actually pumping you either use a uh, uh, slurry pump or something for actually for pumping it but more than the centrifugal pump positive displacement pumps are very used but whatever you do you disturb the environment so it involves disturbing the seabed sending it to the top and after that actually processing letting out the debris and the waste water into the thing so at what depth you really put these discharges also matters so there are actually uh, there are environmental guidelines for actually uh, doing this uh, this work as well and uh, there are different countries actively involved in development of this thing that is korea china japan and belgium and the european union of course india is also there and uh, so far the technology demonstration has been carried out by usa japan and belgium so this is the famous glomer explorer experiment which was done by us in late in mid 70s okay so 600 tons of nodules were pumped using this one and later very recently belgium has taken a lead and they have done uh, they have demonstrated their the locomotion of their mining machine at 4500 meters water depth at as late as 2021 and then sms mining system was designed by nautilus minerals uh, very few details are available about the utility of the system but uh, the design has been done and uh, japan is the first country to experiment mining deep sea hydrothermal vents and they have demonstrated their machine in 2017 jogmek uh, japanese uh, uh, institution they have deployed excavators at a depth of 1600 meters water depth and pumped the polymetallic sulfides to the mother ship 
So if you take Indian program, it's actually a case study. Um, actually, we have been allotted an area in 13 degrees south, uh, where 380 million metric tons of uh, polymetallic nodules are available. And uh, uh, it has four components. One is exploration, AA, and mining and metallurgy. A lot of work has been done by National Ministry of Oceanography Goa in exploration and environmental data. They are still continuing the work. The mining work, technology development work has been given to NIOT and uh, the metallurgy of the extra extraction of the uh, process actually of the extracting metals from the these minerals actually has been done by one institute called IIMT uh, in Bhuvaneshwar, India. So this is the area uh, after surveying one lakh of around uh, uh, 0.15 uh, billion square kilometers, uh, India has actually relinquished that 50% of that one and we retained around 75,000 square kilometers and a test mine site has been identified by NIO Goa. So NIOT started preliminary consideration studies and we started with a, a system called a flexible riser. We don't have a drill ship for actually developing a rigid riser system. So we thought we will demonstrate using a flexible riser system, which involves an umbilical cable, which supplies the power and control signals and brings back the data and a hose for pumping the nodules to the surface. So the seabed actually on the seabed, there is a mining machine, which has a collector crusher and a pump, which can pump the nodules to the hose. So, um, with this advantage is that multiple mining machines can be operated. So we started with a sand mining system that we procured from University of Zygan, uh, uh, Germany, and later we converted it into a mining machine for 500 meters and end-to-end -end demonstration was given in 2010. But unfortunately at 500 meters, we don't have nodules for the relayed artificial nodules and we proved the system. Based on ex this experience, we wanted to make a system for 5,000 meters. As a precursor to that one, we made an in-situ soil tester and measured the seabed conditions. And we made a remotely operated vehicle for 6,000 meters and investigated the water column in the mining site. After these two inputs were given, we designed a system for 6,000 meters. As you can see, this is the mothership Sagar Nidhi. And this is a pumping station, intermediate pumping station. And this is a mining machine. We pump the nodules to this here. And from here, using a high pressure pump, we pump it to the surface. So uh, these are the specifications we have drawn based on our studies. And then calculating all the forces that is required for mining and moving the vehicle, we started sizing the different components, that is hose, what is the capacity of the pump? What is the power required? And all, all these things were sized and we started developing it. As a first step towards that one, in 2021, March, April, we deployed our mining machine and approved the locomotion at 5,270 meters water depth. This is the first time that such a, any machine has crawled on seabed at these depths. So these are our future plans. We want to make them, uh, next test our pumping machine, then integrate the pump and the mining machine and give a demonstration of the mining at site in Indian Ocean by 2024. So having done all these things, we realized the limitations of ROV and AUV, that's unmanned vehicles. And we found that if we can combine these disadvantages and remove the disadvantages, we can have a a human operated uh, man means uh, underwater vehicle. And we, as our literature survey showed that there are such systems available with USA Alvin and uh, Nautil uh, uh, from Ephraimer and Shinkoi from Japan and Geolong from China. So we started developing our own manned submersible called Masya 6000. Uh, this is the overall uh, configuration. Uh, we intended to take three human beings to 6,000 meters water depth in this machine. Uh, these are the brief specifications. Actually, it has an uh, endurance of 12 to 16 hours, but in the emergency conditions, we can have 96 hours endurance. So uh, now these are the critical technologies. Man-ratedness is the main criticality. 
and we have to design a titanium alloy sphere for 6,000 meters water depth of the 2.1 meter diameter. So many of these things are actually first time in the country we are doing and uh, uh, we are in the process of developing it. So this is a general arrangement we have arrived at and many of the components have been already realized the integration is in progress. So with these things, uh, India has acquired the entire ecosystem of underwater vehicles that are required for the exploration of uh, ocean resources, that is ROV, soil tester, underwater drilling machine, and AUV, and uh, uh, underwater mining machine. And very, very soon, we hope to uh, have a manned submersible in our harbor. So the summary is that ocean is a treasure trove of uh, strategic minerals. And as we are actually exhausting our uh, uh, terrestrial resources, we need to depend on ocean mining. And technology is not ready. We are actually proving the technical viability, but commercial viability is to be established. But it is really maturing. So it is very, we are very hopeful that um, commercial viability will be established soon. And, uh, and at the Ministry of Health Science India, uh, we are actually at the forefront actually in exploration of this. Uh, uh, minerals and uh, we hope to give a demonstrative mining uh, by 2024. And uh, this technology, whatever we are developing, it should be technically, economically, and environmentally viable. So we have we are in the process of sensitizing the industry uh, for participation uh, after uh, development and the demonstration. So uh, expertise, equipment, environment, ecology and economy are the key elements of this venture. So uh, this is my favorite quote. This is the quote from the team of uh, Glomer Explorer. And I read it. The impossible is indeed possible when talented engineers, you can add scientists as well there, with the courage to take prudent risks. It may sound like oxymoron, but prudent risks uh, are actually uh, we do take in uh, in the field uh, are provided an incentive to stretch the state of the art. Yeah. So today's uh, impossible is the tomorrow's difficulty, and today's difficulty is uh, yesterday's difficulty is today's possibility. Uh, so um, realizing the Dr. importance. Rama, of you have to go to conclusions, please. Uh, this is the last slide, please. So realizing the importance of this uh, deep ocean resources, government of India has announced one uh, deep ocean mission, which has six verticals and in which the first vertical, the, the project mode uh, operation of this uh, development, uh, project mode development of the systems has been really uh, given a, a, a mission a mode uh, direction. So uh, very soon, uh, uh, we would like to uh, uh, give a uh, demonstration of uh, this mining uh, at the uh, mining site that has been allotted to India by the International Civil Authority. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramadas, for this comprehensive presentation. Unfortunately, we have no time for questions. We move all the discussion to the round table uh, period. We are already 20 minutes late. So I would suggest to go to the next paper. It's again on harvesting from the ocean and it's on renewable energy, offshore renewable energy. So I would ask the, uh, unfortunately, Jan Hervé Derouac, which is the director of the uh, French uh, network on marine energy could not make it. So he has sent us a recording and I would ask the operator to run the recording, please. Can you run the re recording, please? Let me send him a message. Dear participants, uh, let me first thank you for this initiative of a regular knowledge summit between India and France. I think it's of utmost importance to be able to share information on our ongoing collaborations, but also on domains where it can be widely amplified. And thank you for inviting me to 
testimony in this framework and sorry for not being able to attend online in the live program. Today, after a very brief presentation of the institute I'm representing, I will devote this short time on an ongoing collaboration on ocean energy, which goes beyond our two countries since it's international. I talk about the technology core collaboration program on ocean energy systems that runs under the umbrella of the International Energy Agency. Well, France Energy Marine is a public private research institute. With 60 researchers, we have the largest team in France exclusively devoted to offshore renewable energy. Established in 2012, our yearly budget now reaches 6 million of euro. In fact, we belong to a set of 15 such institutes co-financed in a national funding program, the so-called Investment for the Future. Here, uh, you find a couple of illustrations uh, that uh, uh, illustrate uh, taken from our projects. Namely, we work in resource assessment, sea state observation for design, technical issues on submarine components such as export cables and mowing lines, simulation software and in situ monitoring protocols, and also environmental integration on all compartments, etc., etc. Offshore renewable energy means ocean energy technologies, such as wave, tidal range, and current, ocean thermal energy conversion, and osmotic pressure, as well as offshore wind, whether bottom fixed or floating. They all have their evolving level of maturity. But for all of them, we support the development through industry-driven research and development. The aim of our institute is to reduce the cost of these technologies, to fasten their delivery to the society, and to ease their acceptability as means toward the energy transition. Well, from the results of our research projects, we build up expertise data, methodologies, software, standards, etc., etc. We are a national institute with headquarters in Brest, in Brittany, and branches on all the French maritime coastlines, even overseas. Indeed, for us, it's of utmost importance to secure the developers with an easy access to open sea test sites with every specific local constraints. Well, now I'd like to shift to the fact that India and France play a special role in driving the efforts of a needed worldwide collaboration. Indeed, Mrs. Purnima Zaila from NIOT is co chair, and myself, I'm chairing the technological collaboration program dedicated to ocean energy systems, which is a group of international experts that meet regularly. This presentation would like to stress on the activities of the IAOES so that new ideas of bilateral collaboration sprinkle in the spirit. Under the umbrella of the International Energy Agency, there are 40 groups of experts working in the so-called TCP. Among them, some are dedicated to renewable energies. And by the way, the International Energy Agency was originally created in 1974 in order to help coordinate a collective response to major disruptions at the time in the supply of oil. It has for many years broadened its scope and now it contributes to the efforts to decarbonize the energy production. Among the TCPs dealing with renewable energies, 
MRE are dealt within two TCPs, the wind energy TCP for offshore wind and the other technologies by the ocean energy systems TCP, the one I was talking about. Uh, which technologies does the TCP OES address? Well, again, wave energy, tidal range, tidal range means dams on the littoral, and tidal currents, turbines in the open ocean, and ocean currents too, ocean thermal gradient, so called OTEC, and salinity gradient. Uh, this group has 23 members from all continents. The experts are drawn from several types of stakeholders in MRI development, as you can see. And indeed, participation in ocean energy systems builds connection between national governments or agencies and industries. This way, it creates networks of experts and it expands the national research capacities. We support projects such as while looking at the environmental effects of monitoring uh, and monitoring efforts, projects on the cost of energy, the way to assess it for wave, tidal, and OTEC. We built an international evaluation framework for ocean energy technologies. We are performing an assessment of the number of jobs created by ocean energy, we really want to describe what are the alternative markets on ocean energy. We also have working groups, working groups uh, on numerical modeling for wave energy, numerical modeling for tidal energy, and also the assessment of OTEC resource. And then we maintain databases on such things as thesis which is an environmental database on ocean energy and offshore wind. There's a World Wide Web uh, Geographical Information System database, yes, on, uh, for ocean energy. And there's also a database of the various consenting processes for ocean energy uh, in, by the, in the various nations. We are really following the technological developments and the successful deployments in all parts of the world. And as in this case, uh, with wave energy. In particular, we testify that several full-scale devices are in the manufacturing phase now or preparing for deployment. That there is a continuous evolution among the TRL scale and the first farms are really being designed. Well, a number of potential breakthroughs have been developed on a wide variety of wave energy technologies. And here you see on the screen uh, a boy developed in, in India by NIOT and now operational, and a wave, uh, um, um, an hybrid platform uh, for instrumentation with both wave and solar energy developed in France here. But you can also yes, witness what's going on in the rest of the world. We do the same for the progress for tidal current energy. And, uh, and we have to admit that in this case, they have been tremendous in the recent years. Indeed, uh, the tidal sector is approaching design convergence. The tidal sector is approaching commercialization with deployment of full-scale devices and also the first arrays of machines. That progress were demonstrated by operating hours accumulated and by figures on the electricity generated. Even though there's always a need for further technology investigation, and demonstration for a long period of time. Look again, it strives uh, in those lucky parts of the world that benefit from tidal current spots, which is not everywhere, of course, 
the way it exists, we have this uh, very uh, um, fruitful development. And after these highlights on the most popular technologies, well, I think it's really necessary to shed the light on ocean thermal energy conversion because it's of utmost interest for India and France. And we all know that it has an enormous natural potential to be exploited and many, many advantages, including that of being a base load and not intermittent energy resource. Uh, piloted by Mrs. Purnima Jaya, uh, there's a white paper that's just been issued that shows that while well, the biggest barrier to more widespread adoption of OTEC technology is financial and not technical, that the basic electricity generation process system is simple and it has, to be proven, it has proven to be reliable in two places in the world, in Hawaii and also in Okinawa and Japan. That what is really missing is the financial guarantee to move beyond small demonstration plants to pre-commercial prototype units. And, well, the conclusion is that it's vital to encourage international cooperation between national governments to share information, plan joint projects, and pool funding. I think this white paper, again uh, piloted by, by, by Purnima Jailal from NIOT, will have very large success and will help a lot developing our tech. About uh, environmental impact every four years, one of the tasks of the TCPOS uh, concludes with the publication of the so-called State of the Art State of Science Report, which is an international reference document on the potential unproven impact of marine renewable energies. Indeed, it provides most current and pertinent published information about the interactions of marine renewable energies, MRE, devices, and associated infrastructure with the animals and the habitats that make up the marine environment. It contains more than uh, 15 chapters written by 40 authors and contributors, and it's published after an extensive review process with over 60 international scientists and engineers from 11 countries, among them uh, India and France. And uh, earlier this year, at OES, we also published a report that will remain a reference document for years to come, although it can always be improved and updated. But it's a so-called international evaluation and guidance framework for ocean energy technologies. This document describes an unambiguous process for the development and for the assessment of wave and tidal technologies. Yes, OTEC is still missing, and that's why it can be completed. But it's inspired by the stage gating process already applied in many industrial sectors such as automotive and uh, aeronautics. Stages are defined and gates, uh, gates are linked to finely detailed criteria and thresholds so that the same understanding applies worldwide. This document is aimed at a wide range of stakeholders, the technology developers themselves, but most importantly, policymakers, because it supports the decision making associated with technology assessment and funding allocation. One of the ultimate objectives is to establish a technology passport, which would facilitate international collaboration in the technology development process. The design, proof of concept, scale test, sea trials, pre-commercial uh, pre demonstrations, etc., etc. Well, some people might think that although ocean energy has great potential to contribute 
to the decarbonization of the energy mix. Uh, current technologies uh, are aimed at niche market due to their technological and economic relatively low maturity compared to other renewable energy sources. At OES, we prefer to emphasize that alternative ocean energy markets, other than at utility scale, at utility scale, um, con contribute to providing carbon-free energy solutions for many human activities and many communities. Uh, the IEA OES uh, um, international vision for ocean energy recognizes that there are several ways in which specific synergies exist within varying industries. Most ocean energy technologies can indeed provide direct power to other blue growth activities uh, like aquaculture or the production of fresh water from sea water through desalination. The three reports list, listed below um, detail many examples but also good practices to properly address the different issues. As an example, a report is devoted to the identification of challenges regarding socio-environmental, regulatory, infrastructure, and financial issues when developing, when deploying ocean energy in islands and remote coastal areas. And this is really interesting for both India and France. Finally, one important topic for us is to keep the, the awareness. Indeed, at IAOES, we create and lead working groups on technology and policy related topics, but also, as I mentioned, on strategic issues. The findings of this task are decimated disseminated by high quality public reports, which are available free of charge on our website. So I advise you not to miss the annual report from which the highlights of wave and tidal and hot tech and energy developments are compiled. And you see the highlights here. Well, please stay informed by a simple click and read. Upon publication of this report, IAOES run a series of one-hour webinars with co-authors, which can be all be viewed on our website. Uh, similarly, by grouping the information according to global time zones, webinars are dedicated to ocean energy outlooks to be reviewed or joined across the year. Well, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to explain how OESTCP helps the sector to build strong collaboration and support rapid development worldwide. India and France fully contribute to this effort and will even do more together. Thank you. So uh, let's move ahead. May I ask the speaker to try to stick on 12 minutes plus three minutes per question uh, we are already more than 20 minutes late if you want to keep uh, enough time for uh, discussions. May I give the floor to David Vincenzelli, who is working in IX Blue, which is a French uh, company, and he will talk about unmanned surface vehicle and their use for surveys and mapping. Please, David, the floor is yours. Can you share your presentation and put okay. on your mic? Yes, thank you, uh, Manel, and bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen. Please let me know if it's fine. Yeah, is it fine? Okay. okay. Fantastic. Um, I'll try to be concise <laughs> and raise more questions than, uh, than, I will, than explanation. Um, so the highlight here is, uh, is more or less on eco with uh, Dr. Ramadan's uh, presentation uh, on the focus on exploration versus uh, the um, uh, collecting samples. Here we are more into uh, talking about the, the, 
the process and the concept of operation to gather data and how to facing this uh, raising need of uh, hydrospatial data, hydrospatial covers, hydrography, oceanographic, uh, geophysical data at sea. Um, yeah, how to face this increased need and, uh, and in parallel, uh, tackle the challenge of reducing our impact, uh, the, the financial impact and the environmental impact of such data gathering. We can't say tomorrow that we will increase um, the marine renewables uh, energy, for instance, or deep sea mining if we increase uh, the impact uh, of uh, uh, um, carbon, uh, yeah, carbon impact of our explorations. Um, so yeah. focus, yeah. So now the main message here today is that autonomy, uh, autonomy no range in autonomous uh, surface ship or uh, in uh, a UV is now very mature. And I will illustrate this uh, presentation with Xbo equipment, but uh, we are not the only one. Uh, there they are a range of, uh, of systems available from, um, from very shallow system, very coastal system, uh, inland water system to uh, deep sea, uh, adapted to deep sea uh, uh, explorations. Um, so going into autonomy, uh, authorized to um, investigate and to innovate into new um, shipbuilding designs. And typically you have an example here with bricks, which is focusing on data gathering and uh, all the sensors being located in uh, the, the system gondola, but it's uh, deployed two meter below the, sea, the, the, sea, the surface. So it looks like a submarine, but it's a surface vessel. Um, and uh, and the, the second point is the hydrodynamic. So it's hydrodynamic to serve data gathering. And um, being autonomous means that we do not have to accommodate human being on board. And that gives that free your innovation. Uh, and that's one of the, the results of, the, of this uh, new uh, capabilities or new opportunity it is such design that you can see on, on the slide here. Um, yeah. So, at the end, your, the system you will design is purpose made to sail well, to sail fast, to be uh, very efficient in terms of fuel consumption, and also to offer a very uh, quiet and stable environment for uh, data gathering. And what, what we've proved with uh, such a system with BRICS is that we can uh, collect data in C state, up to C state five, so meaning uh, facing waves of up to two meter, uh, 2.5 meter in, in peak and two meter in average, uh, and collecting good quality data, typically for uh, hydrographic survey or a geophysical survey. Uh, the technologies are now mature. Um, here, here is a, a presentation showing in in three years how uh, we scaled up uh, on the project Drix, and I'm sure that all other uh, competitors have done more or less the same. Now we all come with a three to five years uh, um, experience background. Uh, so from the proof of concept to the industrialization, uh, it's uh, three years of collecting data more or less worldwide. So uh, now uh, we uh, we can uh, we have an increased footprint and we can propose our man system uh, in Europe, in India, in Australia, in uh, in in US or in a bit everywhere in the world. Um, these systems are always supervised. They can be supervised from a shore base uh, through, through a satellite control, or they can be supervised uh, as a demultiplicator of a mothership uh, working side by side at the same speed, uh, gathering very similar uh, data. Uh, oh, it's <laughs> efficient, not slow carbon, but low carbon survey platform. Um, here is an example uh, showing the how um, uh, how we can best optimize uh, our time at sea and reduce our impact of uh, data gathering. Uh, we were challenged by the, the French archaeological uh, office to uh, investigate um, an area which is. Uh, um, located at the border between uh, France, the island Saint-Pierre-et-Miquelon, 
located a few kilometers away from uh, the Canadian um, Nova Scotia, uh, oh, no, Newfoundland, sorry, Newfoundland. So um, we were, the objective was to cover an area which is roughly 30 kilometer by 10 kilometer. Um, the total line kilometer to cover were 4,200 kilometer. Uh, due to the, the high challenge in terms of the survey grid, uh, the average survey speed was six knots, uh, while our system is able to collect as much as the speed, but uh, the data density required uh, forced us to slow down. And the other challenge was to operate from the three different types of command control. Uh, we could operate from a ship time to time, and we, have, we had to jump from on three different survey uh, support platforms, um, a fishing vessel, uh, um, a coast guard vessel, and another larger coast guard military vessel. Um, we also could operate from a field office in hotel and also uh, from our main office in La Ciota uh, because of the duration of the job quite last quite long and uh, to to uh, allow some rest to our operators, we, we take um, the control from, uh, from La Ciota in France. Um, so you have here a very large area, very challenging um, weather constraints as we, you can face up to uh, uh, three knots of currents, uh, an average sea state of four in, uh, even in June. Um, and this, this uh, project, was covered in 34 days um, on only supervised autonomy, ne never teleoperated. It was always supervised. I mean that the system gets an instruction, run survey lines. We have access to all the data that are gathered by the system. We can do an online QC control. We can do online QC control of the data, but also of uh, the, the um, the environment, uh, the, the environmental awareness, meaning the, is there an obstacle? Is there a fishing vessel around? Uh, is there um, another, another vessel passing by? Is there a container floating? So all this uh, information of the environmental awareness were accessible uh, remotely, uh, but we were not manually teleoperated the system at all times. It was uh, only uh, by sending instructions. Uh, we could teleoperate it for emergency, but that was not the purpose of, of the, the project. Um, so we operate for 34 days, uh, and during only three days of uh, weather standby, when the sea states were much higher than sea state five, and we were working far too close to the shore. Uh, we observed the wind speed up to 45 knots, current, uh, um, current, I mean, um, water current, tidal current up to 2.5 knots, uh, you have an illustration on the bottom right of bad visibility, uh, and we operate from 8 to uh, 170 meter water depth. So it won't speak too much to specialists, but uh, for non-specialists, just imagine collecting 3.6 terabytes of data in 30 days without with very little uh, weather standby. Um, um, with a very regular constant speed, with a very high data quality, so, so high that uh, we did absolutely zero, no manual cleaning. We uh, delivered all the data set to the client. There was absolutely no spikes to remove on the data. So we could uh, get the, uh, the highest data density that could be collected that day with this speed. Um, the estimated Total fuel consumption for these 34 days is uh, 1.2 tons. For people that are regularly working at sea, uh, 1.2 tons is roughly the consumption of a 20 meter catamaran survey survey catamaran. So uh, a conventional survey catamaran will uh, will consume 1.2 tons of fuel per day per 24 hours operation. Will be much more uh, constraints in terms of uh, environment, uh, a typical 20 meter catamaran cannot operate with more, one, more than one meter of wave height. Uh, so here with, with the, the DRIX, you have a system which is more endurance, which is uh, more uh, environmental, uh, far less environmental constraint, and consume only 1.2 tons over 34 days of operation. 
an illustration of the data quality. I'm using hydrographic data, bathymetric data, because it's a data set that are, I am very familiar with. Uh, but that very good way to illustrate uh, how a quiet environment, uh, also a known environment in terms of offset of compensation, uh, announce uh, the, the the capacity to collect uh, good data uh, good data quality. Um, typically, as as presented just before, I, I did not uh, mention it, but um, the performance of the the, the multi beam was announced by thirty percent. Uh, we could gather full swap survey, so data sets nearly up to the outer beams, even at two hundred seventy meter with a system which is conventionally limited to a deployment down to 150 meter. So a system that we operate from vessel that we limit to uh, areas that are below 150 meter here was producing full swaths at, uh, not full swaths, sorry, it was nearly 200 meter swaths at 270 meter water depth. So it's a, an improvement at the minimum of 30% of the sensor capability. Um, on this illustration, it's a, a running a survey over a reference area, uh, a reference area that belongs to the, um, the French Hydrographic Service, which is actually located very close by uh, Manel office uh, in Brittany. And um, so the, we covered this area, we repeated the survey at four, six, eight, ten, 10, and 14 knots. And the Statistic distribution of the data sets falls all under uh, the criteria or the IHO criteria, but uh, basically you have uh, the, the data set, um, the differential statistic, all data falls within a standard error of uh, less than 10 centimeter. Uh, imagine over an area that uh, it's a few, few, few kilometers large, two, two by three, collecting millions of data and having a uh, uh, statistic uh, error uh, less than 10 centimeter uh, over the full data set. Uh, of course, you cannot run autonomous if you haven't uh, integrated all uh, the environmental assessment needed uh, to uh, operate safely. And uh, what we do at Xblue is that we merge all information that can be gathered from a radar camera, LIDAR, infrared camera, uh, AIS, and uh, bathymetric charts as well um, into uh, an obstacle awareness uh, system. And this obstacle awareness uh, system allows the, the, the DRIGS to uh, take decision at sea and avoid uh, obstacle by itself. Uh, it respects um, all the lines of the, the code regs uh, that are um, uh, uh, applied to a conventional uh, surface ship navigation. Um, what is a paramount for XBlue is that all the data are, can be supervised uh, remotely. You cannot perform remote operation without having the capacity to supervise. You are responsible for the data set. You are responsible for the navigation. You must be aware of what is happening. Um, so through our uh, over the horizon capability, we offer, uh, as you, it's it's uh, in the background of the image. Uh, we can uh, even operating through satellite access all the health information of the system to take decision if we can we have to slow down, reduce, or go to maintenance uh, if anything happen in the, in the engine or on the propeller uh, or on the. Uh, slight uh, reduction of the, the RPM of the engine or anything related to the health of the system. Uh, and we have also access to the data quality so that uh, we can also adjust our line plan, um, reduce the, the speed or increase the speed or reduce the swaths, et cetera, pending uh, on the, the data quality. So the two, two major things we want to assess is uh, safety, uh, safety of the system itself, system of environmental um, um, assessment, uh, navigation, yes, all related to navigation, and the data quality. Um, so pushing this uh, innovation into the world of gather, uh, that, the, the hydrospatial data gathering, and that's the eco of Mr. Ramos, um 
presentation, Dr. Ramadan's uh, presentation. Um, if you uh, if you merge the capability of this new and crude surface vehicle with uh, new standards of um, uh, of eco sounders, um, it will largely increase your uh, capability to survey uh, with a low impact large area or uh, being more uh, let's say um, take more risk in performing routine survey, uh, typically for environmental assessment survey, uh, because you are lowering your cost of survey. Uh, I, I should, I, uh, sorry, I, I was presenting uh, through the gondola, you can adapt many systems. It's a very uh, flexible uh, capability. It's much easier to, to lift up on the, on the key to change the, the gondola compared to oceanographic vessel. Uh, so it's a very versatile uh, systems, and typically at XBlue we we uh, performed uh, now routinely multi beam plus sub bottom uh, survey uh, gathered simultaneously from the same gondola uh, using uh, uncrewed system, and you can see uh, how straight are the line, how how easier is the interpretation when you can count on such good data quality and such. Uh, um, precise uh, line plan. Um, so, so innovation goes also through the creating a full ecosystem to uh, use uh, an crude survey vessel. What we want is that our surface ship is capable of performing 90% of the, the or 100% of the the survey ship uh, geophysical survey data uh, collection. So we have uh, announced the capability of our uh, drakes with a uh, fixed towing, uh, towing wing uh, that you can see on, on these images. Uh, oh, oh, we, we are co conscious that this is limited to uh, shallow water depths, less than 100 meters, uh, with potential potent possibility to go much uh, slightly deeper, but we won't go to the very deep with such system. But that illustrates how we can couple surface ship and uh, and deployed uh, near near the near the, the bottom uh, deployed wing or AUV. So you could typically in the very near future replace uh, what we we are doing with uh, this towing with an AUV, and you will gather. Uh, as mentioned by Dr. Ramadas, uh, UV are limited by because when you launch them, you cannot uh, really monitor the data quality and uh, the, the coverage uh, performed. Uh, here, what we are proposing is that we can announce the capability of UV. We can announce their endurance, their uh, the risk in in, uh, in sending them uh, offshore by uh, having a relay on surface that is uh, that allows you to have. Uh, the capability to monitor in real time the data quality or the data coverage uh, performed by the AU. Um, other capability uh, that are announced by the, the arrival of these new USBs are the, the, the use of uh, synthetic aperture sonar. Uh, so at Igbo, we have developed uh, uh, an antenna, uh, yeah, a sonar that uh, is. Uh, Based on static aperture technology, and I, I can take time to uh, reply some questions or uh, make private presentation on uh, how it works. But uh, typically, we propose um, over a full swath, uh, constant resolution, real time georeference geo mosaic that speed up the data processing, the swaths of uh, 500 meter or up to 1,007 meter, depending on the, on the frequency used and the resolution of seven centimeter at 150 kilohertz and 40 centimeter at 50 kilohertz. Um, so the interest is in deep ocean, uh, yeah, it's to uh, gather very wide, yeah, large source survey uh, and at a very high resolution compared to having a multi beam on the, on the an AUV, you will have uh, uh, from synthetic aperture sonar, you will have very high resolution, less than 40 centimeter, and a very high, large swath. Um, in shallow water, again, when the multi beam is limited in swath, 
uh, from uh, when you when you operate from a ship at 40 meter water depth, it will typically have a, um, a 100 uh, meter or 150 meter swath. Here you will achieve 500 meter swath with seven centimeter resolution. An illustration of what we can do and uh, what we have now, it's the capability to uh, uh, construct an interferometric uh, bathymetry. So you will get the sonar imagery, the capability to distinguish, discriminate objects together with the bathymetric information. Uh, you have an illustration on the top right and uh, just uh, for your eyes on the, on the left, it's uh, an anchor, um, two, a two meter long, two meter long anchor a chain with blocks of 30 centimeter large and two tires to, uh, to scale up. And you will see that uh, the resolution is constant um, if you are close to the, to the, to the fish or uh, also on the outer beams. Now the last illustration of uh, the construction of a bathymetric data out of the, the sonar imagery. Um, and as I was saying, to illustrate the, um, by reducing the cost of survey and reducing the impact, the, the carbon impact of such survey, uh, it, it opens room to a more, uh, to multiple, multiple application and uh, to um, um, allow uh, more often to take the decision, I will have to, I can go to assess this field. I can routinely perform uh, a survey by, uh, by using this input system. Um, typically it's an illustration by using the, the 3D multi-beam camera uh, built by, by XBlue. We can perform seabed charting, ecosystem baseline monitoring, uh, use it also as a static uh, station-based bathymetry and uh, yeah, that's just, uh, just to illustrate uh, how we can enhance uh, the use of our time at sea by um, putting such a such camera on a food system. Um, and the last uh, uh, I wanted to present today, it's to, uh, as I, 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 yeah, as we recognize that the major challenge is uh, to explore the, the the deep sea, uh, XBU is now working on a large, longer version of uh, our drakes uh, with the, the objectives to uh, do a trans oceanic uh, capability in one go with only one fuel, uh, one fuel go, I would say, um, um, to have to be fully redundant in the propulsion uh, so that we can, um, uh, yeah, we can more. Uh, more safely operate uh, uh, USVs uh, when we have no capability to in, to uh, reach it uh, to uh, as quick as we could we can do it when we are working near shore. I think I'm running out of time to conclude. Um, the autonomous survey platforms are mature technology. Uh, they can adapt to a wide range of uh, of uh, acoustic or non-acoustic. Also, uh, we could we we can think also to deploy. Um, uh, environmental uh, probes. Uh, it reduced the impact of data gathering, it increased the range of application, and it reduced the cost of large scale survey and routine survey. Our major challenges now is to uh, uh, program to prepare the next uh, survey concept of operation uh, by adapting the survey uh, pattern depending on what is observed by the, by the, the system. Uh, while running, typically adapting blind plan depending on the uh, weather observations or uh, wave observations or the data, uh, the data quality. Uh, it's also the community's acceptance and communities goes from administrations that uh, show low uh, such system to go at sea uh, to uh, the acceptance of uh, fishermen and, and communities and uh, scientific communities. Uh, and the data management, uh, as we can see, we can increase largely the number of uh, the quantity of data gathered. And we, as we reduce the cost, we can imagine uh, being more time at sea uh, gathering data. And that uh, raised the, the, the challenge of uh, managing that data and use them. And uh, that's all for me. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, David. We have a question from Dil Sarajapan. Please, a short question. 
What is the minimum depth uh, to use this system? Can it be less than eight meters? Uh, yes, it can be less than eight meter. Um, the gondola is two meter deep. Um, if you work in a very calm sea, you can suppose that you could easily uh, survey in, uh, in three to four meter water depths. Uh, if the weather is slightly worse, then I would advise to uh, limit your survey to uh, five or six meter water depths. And uh, we also have a thought of a system that could announce uh, the, the, the capacity of the drinks by uh, uh, reducing the, the draft of the gondola. Uh, it's not trivial, uh, but it can, uh, it, it can be a good solution if you have a very large scale uh, shallow water survey. Uh, we, we have also a system that can be fitted on drinks to allow you to uh, have a only 80 centimeter draft. Um, well, but let's say as it is and uh, keeping the same performance, drinks can operate uh, in water depths ranging from three to uh, to <laughs> to very deep. Okay, thank you. Can you uh, stop sharing your screen so we yes. can go ahead, please? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next paper is mine, so I will try to stick on the schedule if possible. It's we're getting later and later. So my presentation will be about a new project that we have started uh, in uh, cooperation between India and France in marine science and technology, which is all good and it stands for Go Atlantic Cooperation. And uh, I will show you some of the history and where we are now. So the GOAT approach is a bottom-up approach. So what we try to do is to anticipate by a strategic analysis, what will be the Indo-French relationship in the five or 10 years from now, and try to establish bridges between uh, scientists and researchers that will be robust enough to survive to any political changes, let's say. It has been a global action. That means it's not a one-to-one. -one. Uh, we have uh, been uh, uh, collaborating between a French group and uh, uh, IIT Goa. And that has been developed in relation with industry, in particular with Naval Group. And that was done under the aegis of Campus Mondial de la Mer, which is a network of uh, cooperation uh, in the area of uh, Brittany of all the actors in sea technology and uh, oceanography. So it's uh, for Indian people, it's very convenient because if you go there, you have a single input to all what's happening in France in the area. And as we see, we also have another network uh, included in the GOAT project. So the first contact, as you see, it's a long-term action was in 2017, 2017. And then finally, we could sign a letter of intent uh, between the French consortium, Naval Group, and IIT Goa. And that was signed during the summit in New Delhi. And by that time, marine science and technology were not present there. It was not one of the priorities. And just after we had a visit from a French delegation to Goa to uh, uh, investigate all the things that we could do together. And in return, we had a visit from uh, seven academics from IIT Goa to the CTEC week. That was a good occasion so they could see all what's happening in the area. And that was supported by the partners. And we had many visits and presentations. So we, we had to see what's happening in Goa and they had to see what's happening in Brest. And uh, finally, in 2020, we had a CEFIPRA workshop and we had a big delegation of 10 people, including the director and the dean of IIT Goa that was supported by CEFIPRA. 
and uh, the director of CEPIPRA was part of the game and she participated to many seminars and visits. And in this context, we have signed an MOU between uh, uh, that has a nine French partners and IFT Go. And we mentioned that the door is open to new partners because some of them were not able to sign by that time. Some of them had many administrative problems, etc. But that was fully supported by the Brest uh, by sending a letter to from the mayor of Brest to a majority. This is the consortium, as you see, Campus Mondial de la Mer, as I mentioned, is a, a network of uh, actors in the area, IIT Goa, Polmer, Britain Atlantic, is another network which is more project oriented, and it's one of the poles of excellence, we call them in France, that means Paul, they gather, maybe they are uh, major actors of research, you have Polmer, has two branches, one is in Atlantic and one is in the Mediterranean Sea. Any Naval Group and Insta Britain are engineering school. UBO is um, the University of Press. France Energy Marine, you have seen that presentation, they are renewable marine energy. Uh, and SHOM is a hydrographic services of the Navy. And Naval Group, as you all know them are a marine uh, com international marine uh, com company uh, issue i mean based in france so they all signed this agreement and then we could start really work on that and try to make it a success and uh, so uh, we defined cooperation topics so as you see it's very wide because you have many area of expertise in iit goa and uh, either existing or prospective because IT Goa is growing up and we also have the mirror in the Brittany area so it goes from renewable marine energy to ocean and climate influence and including uh, combustion technology like ship pollution in the harbors marine biotechnology non-destructive testing of materials for shipbuilding bioenvironment, AUV, which is a hot issue, as you have seen just in the paper before, including the payload, like imaging, data processing, et cetera, and including underwater acoustics. So it's a wide range of cooperation of topics. We define several range of mobility of action from short term, mob uh, faculty mobility, postdoctoral, PhD student, master student, and undergraduate and even up to teenager what we wanted to establish is a long-term cooperation so we plan to have visit of teenagers which are children of the professor in india to go to france and vice versa to establish really long-term links and aside that we have some what we call structuring action that mean people taking the project uh, for the moment i'm playing this role and we also need to have uh, 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 French courses for Indian students. Uh, for French to go to India is to speak English is enough, but not in the other way around if they want to appreciate. And to, we have predefined some scholarship for students from visit of IIP, and it goes to research projects that have applied to some CEFIPRA financing up to uh joint research center so as you see it's a very ambitious project and it looks for the long-term cooperation we're also investigating the uh, goa environment not only iit goa but the rest of uh, what's happening in this area in iit so we visited nio national institute of oceanography and ih which is national institute of hydrography which is School of Indian Hydrographers, which is equivalent to the School of French Hydrographers, which are in, in the breast. We've also visited Goa Shipyard and Terry, which is the Energy and Resource Institute. And now the IIT has signed some of the agreement with this institution, so it will be easy to cooperate through IIT with this institution. 
and they have integrated marine science and technology in their development plan. And this is important because we were there at the very beginning of the installation of IAT Goa, and together we proposed some cooperation in marine science and technology that were accepted on the other side. Acceptance, mutual acceptance between academic was the key uh, important things and having this bottom-up operated. So we started the kickoff in 2020. We are preparing to accept 30 students uh, from India. Uh, IIT Go has established uh, uh, something similar to the French system, which is a final year project. It was one of the first IIT to do that. And we also were planning to go there with a few students. And all this has been stopped by the COVID, as you could imagine. So the date was not the most appropriate to start. So we put everything in standby and continued uh, maintaining contact through several virtual meetings, workshops, and uh, uh, exchanges. And some visits, we have a few visits, but only I think two visits could were possible due to the uh, uh, sanitary conditions. So we are planning now a new kick off, kick off for which will be in 2022 and hopefully the uh, sanitary condition will allow that. We will start with student and academic exchange in order to fuel the exchanges between the two institutions. And we are planning a, a academic visits uh, at the occasion of uh, IEEE Ocean Conference in Chennai and uh, hopefully we'll be able to make it to Chennai and to Goa so we can restart again and uh, actually we are gathering the uh, student uh, the wishes of the student that will want to go either from India to France or to France to India. Uh, the student exchange will be at the master level. So this is the easy way to do it. Uh, master project, you don't need to have any changes in the curriculum of the people. It's a simple way of starting exchanges. And the next uh, occasion, as I mentioned, will be to invite our colleague to the CTEC week, as I mentioned at the opening, that will take place in September. 26 to 30 and as i mentioned also previously the host country will be india and we are working together hardly with the embassies with the ministries on both sides to make it a success so i hope i have we covered some of the delay hopefully if you have as you know questions so we will move to the next topic and the next topic will be given by christoph Maes, and it will be on a very uh, important topic of uh, interest for us uh, which is the monitoring of plastic in the ocean and how we can handle this uh, uh, difficult issue so christoph the floor is yours Thank you, Anel. Did you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK, thank you. And I would like first to acknowledge my co-author, Rene Garrillo, which gave me the opportunity to present our work on the observing and monitoring plastic. Uh, OK. And uh, in the ocean, so I will give a, a short presentation of the uh, general assessment on this and a case study dedicated to the uh, problem, the same problem in Indonesia. So briefly, we know that uh, it's a plastic pollution in the ocean. It's a very pressing environmental issue of present time. And uh, if we want to develop more and more detection and mitigation, we need to understand the, uh, uh, the pathway of the plastic into the oceans as an integrated approach. And it means that we are crossing different disciplines and we need to have more collection of data uh, and many from many sources as possible. Well, how did I change? I didn't arrive to change. Take this down. No. 
Okay, I, I have to, to move to the other one. Um, <laughs> sorry for that, but as you know, you have the, it's not a, a decision or it's not a fact that we can really uh, discuss, but we produce more than 300 or 400 million tons of plastic per year. And we know that around 3% of this production is going to our oceans. And everywhere we look into the oceans, the different compartments, we find plastics now. So it means that if we want to understand the pathway and the fate of plastic into the ocean, we need to have data. So we need to have data uh, on the beach or along the shoreline, that, uh, the shoreline of our coastlines. We need to have data on floating marine litter, so at the sea surface. Also, the connection with the uh, water column will be very difficult because it's really the place where we need, we are lacking a lot of data. So it's really a data set that is really in their construction and, and very poor. And at the end, we know also that um, marine litter is accumulated into the seafloor and into the sediments, where we see the strongest uh, trends in accumulation of plastics. We have also the connection with the biota, especially due to the ingestion uh, by marine uh, litter of by different species. And we know that this is connected to the water column. So you have the figure eight, which shows the different connection between the compartments of the, of the oceans. And the difficulties will be that we need, we have some challenges in terms of observations. So just go back on the fact, uh, most of the plastics entering our oceans is coming from river moss. So we have a, con a strong connection with the lands by the rivers. We need to have direct measurement concentration of plastic particles via in-situ sample and water surface, just because the remote sensing is very difficult. I will come back on this later. And for the uh, uh, help of the physics into the ocean, we need to have direct measurements of movements of currents, for example, but also currents add in, into the water column. And it's where the remote sensing can help. So the in-situ observation can be done by field surveys, especially along shore, shorelines, for example, but also with drones and crowdsourcing, or what we call citizen uh, uh, sciences. We need to, uh, to use, actually, we need to use indirect indicators for the connection between the land and the sea. And it could be uh, linked to the coastal and watershed population and the beaches physical characteristics. And the, as you can imagine, it's a different uh, dispersion or, or accumulation problem when you consider a sand beach as compared to a rock sand or to a rock beach or so on. We have also uh, to have uh, some kind of evaluation of the sea by sources of plastics from the ship traffic and maritime traffic and, and fisheries of, uh, activity. We try to develop automated uh, microplastic sensor for in situ measurements and using also the high frequency uh, radar system along the coast. And finally, we have the potential monitoring by, via satellites for remote sensing, but it's really a, a problem of space time resolution. If we look at the characteristics of the satellite sensor at the present time, we see that satellite remote sensing is only applicable for floating debris or close to the surface. So it's why we think that we may have some uh, uh, work to do with imaging radar, so the, what we call SAR imaging, to provide in, uh, high resolution information on, and, and also, I mean, remote sensing need to, uh, to be used to provide high resolution information on parameter of the sea surface. So it could be from topography, surface waves, winds and currents, for example. And we need to correlate the movements of marine debris to identify the conversion front or so on, where the debris, the floating debris collects if we want to imagine some solutions at the end. To do this step, we need to couple with other ocean general circulation models to have the currents at the scale where you are considering your problem of the pollution. And the Rene want also to mention that this is a really important uh, way of development in the community is to consider the artificial intelligence supervising methodology to consider from the real world and the capability of measuring uh, different parameters in the, in the ocean to go to the prediction and the model selection to have to, uh, to kind of uh, very uh, accurate analysis. So this is for the... Um, for the general assessments and the home tech measures that uh, Rene want to put in and straightforward here is that 
We need uh, to establish an integrated information system that meets the societal uh, knowledge needs for decision and policy making and the scientific community, which may help to understand the uh, pathway and the fate of the marine plastics. So while we are very, uh, very different promising observation techniques and approaches from in situ and remote sensing, many of them need to be adapted and improved to be uh, to provide useful solutions. And in this sense, I would like to uh, to now switch to a, a specific uh, case study that we have done and is still in progress, work in progress in Indonesia. So the project has been funded by the uh, IFD, the uh, Agence France, French Agency for Development. And the context with, is really to, to help the Indonesian institution awareness and knowledge about pollution in plastics. So it's why we have a, a part monitoring and modeling the circulation of marine plastic in Indonesia. In order, if we want to implement inter, uh, intervention or solution and prevention, and at least some kind of recommendation to help the support of the monitoring and monitoring marine debris. So we focus in Indonesia first, because as uh, we, you, you know, maybe the famous study of by Jembeck in, two, two, uh, in 2015, just stressed that the Indonesia was the second uh, most important uh, country with mismanaged plastic, which goes from land to uh, the ocean. It's a, re it's a, re a real concern also for Indonesia institution just because six million of people are working and depend, uh, their work depend on fisheries and aquaculture, and it's very uh, huge amount of revenue for the for the country. So it's really important for these guys to uh, to have some uh, information at the end. So the project is dedicated to a different work package, and I will only present the work package dedicated to the Lagrangian dispersion. But you have to remember that we have a modeling package also, and also a real. Um, in situ observation uh, for a dispersion experiment with real drifter, sorry. So to identify the main source, we consider only two sources. So it will be the main river inputs from Indonesia as illustrated here by the blue lines coming from uh, an atmospheric runoff model and the density of the population into, uh, into the, along the coastlines, which is uh, represented here in orange and red. So we consider 21 rivers in collaboration with our uh, Indonesian partners, which has been identified as really important rivers in terms of pollution and in terms of uh, river inflow discharge. So the discharge is function of time and we develop uh, just um, a correlation with particles which will be deployed into the oceans. This means that we here in this case, we consider 2 million of 50 particles into the currents and the currents are provided by the cement products based on a combination of the uh, ocean dynamics current, the stokes drift is, is the part due to the waves and the tides. So before to show you the main results and, and so on, I just show you here an animation from 11 rivers. So you can see that at the beginning, the flow of particles really follows the coastlines depending on the origin of the source of the river. And after a few months, of course, the dispersion is occurring and you have a lot of dispersion around the Java Sea and a lot of particles are moving towards the Indian Ocean and finally move, move on or move out the original domain that we consider here. And with time, you, you see exactly the same into the Pacific, where, which is less intense in this case. So you can see also that most of the time you have the effect of the mesoscale AD activity into the oceans and also the coastal currents along the, along the, the different entire internal seas, for example, and the capability of the particle to remove from, from the different uh, origin points to towards the uh, different uh, region of the Indonesian seas. When you look at the mean, uh, you can see that when we do the budget of the, all of these particles, we find 10% after four years of simulation which is still at sea, and the, the figure is, shows the concentration at sea. Most of course, you find most important concentration around Java Sea and, and so on. You can see that 30% are leaving the domain that we consider here, and mostly of them are leaving the domain, the regional region by the uh, Indian Ocean. And most of them, so 60% are beach. So what we call beach here in the model is just when the particle moved to, uh, very close to the uh, land sea uh, mask, 
if we if we are a distance very close to the source, we consider that the uh, the particle is beach, and we remove the computation. If we look in details about the the beaching part, you can see that of course you find the the most important concentration of particle or near most of the time the different river moss. Uh, for example, here in the blue, the blue dots in the general case. And if you look at the, the zoom of around Java C, for example, you can see that we have a, a different, uh, different region with high concentration, but also some part of region which is really less uh, polluted by the, uh, by, by the accumulation of the particles. When we look at the details, we find that 80, more than 80% of particles are still along the coast of Indonesia. So more than 75% of them are located 1,000 kilometers from their source point for the source, like typically at the scale of the Java Island. And most of them, more than 80%, just make their beaching before six months of simulation. So it's very close and very short time scale, which is where we, we find our particles. And finally, we decide also, because this is just a, a mean view of, of the problem, but it could be interesting to look uh, piece, uh, coastline by coastline and to have also the, all the information in terms of, of uh, time variations. So we decide to, uh, to look at the different region of the region, but we divide into a region of interest, mainly look, uh, uh, keeping the idea that the coastlines are really important to consider first. And we put uh, all this information in terms of an atlas of stranding along the Indonesian coastlines and surrounding countries, where you can find the temporal changes, uh, river by river. And also, of course, we, we've just focused on the main important contribution for our coastlines in terms of rivers. So you have here on the left a figure showing the time series, for example, for the North Java coast and, and the spatial distribution, which is associated with this uh, time distribution for the different rivers. And we do that for all the different regions. And this atlas is available on my website or my uh, account on ResearchGate. This is, uh, or you can just uh, contact me and I will send you the, uh, the PDF version of that. So I do not make a really a real summary because it's still work on in terms of in term of progress. But I want to mention that uh, for, for, for the next year, we will have the same idea. Uh, to look at uh, the dispersion and the origin and, and fate of plastic, but into this time at the scale of the uh, Indian Ocean with the help of a postdoc from IRD. And the main topic that we want to, uh, to look at is will be quite similar. So it's look at the first at the ocean dynamics, but we can reproduce with a general circulation model. Lagrangian dispersion, depending on the source that we will be able to, uh, to establish going from population density, uh, fisheries activities, I'm sorry, and, and the sea surface uh, dispersion. We can also apply our, our expertise and our tools in terms of case studies, like the incident of the re recent uh, uh, cargo ship in Sri Lanka, but also more in more conical uh, application like plastic, plastic modeling monitoring for, sorry, along the coastlines and typical islands of the, of the basin. So if you want to participate or to help me on this project, so I, I just want to say that you can contact me and we can exchange and to see how we can collaborate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christophe, for this presentation that shows that pollution never happen in local and it's always at the basin scale. You have one question from Jerome Vialar, who says the standing of particle along the coast deemed to have a very punctual maxima. What is the underlying dynamics of these punctual points of very high debris beaching? All right, what is it? Oh, okay. I think that we are uh, just maybe forget to mention that we are at resolution like 12 degree or even less. So we begin to, to have some resolution of the dynamics, coastal dynamics and connection with the uh, open ocean dynamics. So it's really um, one part of the problem. And the other one is linked to the fact that we are uh, uh, 
we put some freshwater inputs into uh, into the oceans, and we have a specific dynamics uh, due to the uh, river inputs into the ocean. Thank you. So let's move to the next presentation, which uh, is uh, one of the first uh, paper on oceanography, and it's a joint uh, Indo-French work, which is called Tetis. It's a collaboration between IFREMER and IIT Gandhinagar, and it will be presented by Pankaj Fama. Pankaj, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can see your slide. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, let me start. So the project is about tracing evolution of tropical high sand reefs. So the reefs that we are talking about here are usually dead reefs or old reefs from thousand to in some cases, hundred of thousand to some cases, million of years. But first I'd like to uh, thank my collaborator, Stephen, who's not here today. Uh, instead of him, I'm giving this talk. And this is just an initial idea that we have both put together and, and you'll see uh, in this presentation. First of all, why are we doing this project? Secondly, how we are going to do it? And third, thirdly, when are we planning to do it? So let's first start, why are we interested uh, in this project, Tethys? So the scientific rationale is that how will the climate, the ocean and the ice sheet response to the ongoing greenhouse warming? So we all know that the sea level is rising and it is going to rise in the near future. And on the bottom side, there is this plot showing the different scenarios of sea level rise, which could happen in the near future. In any case, it is going to have severe impact on the coastal populations as well as coastal ecosystems. However, what is missing is that we still have relatively poor understanding of the vulnerability and sensitivity of ice sheets uh, due to sustained warming. So for example, uh, on the right hand side above, you can see a big crack. This appeared earlier in 2000 uh, in Larsen Sea ice sheet in, in the Antarctica. And uh, in, the, uh, in the figure below, you can see how this crack started migrating. And uh, where the red dot is representing June 2016, uh, at that time, scientists mentioned that it is growing super fast. And within just one year, this crack ended up uh, its trajectory and, and, and basically uh, carved off this, uh, this big iceberg from this uh, Larsen Sea ice sheet. So this crack couldn't have been answered or predicted and, and there were lots of discussions about it. So we still don't have this uh, uh, predictability of, of how these uh, ice sheets could collapse in the near future and what are their time scales and how they will influence sea level. So what do we do? We go and look at the past records. So being a geologist, we read the past to inform the future. So coral reefs are the ones uh, which have been used uh, for a long time and uh, specifically Tahiti, uh, which is in the Pacific Ocean, uh, where different corals were drilled from different depths and dated. And in the plot here, you can see the age at the x-axis and the depth in the y-axis. So, so what comes up is that you, uh, you can get these types of plots of sea level rise since the last glacial maxima. We'll see later in the talk that the sea level has uh, uh, like, you know, goes up and down cyclically, but this is the last cycle in which it uh, went up from the last glacial maxima, which was 20,000 years ago. So what is peculiar here is this jump, which is called as melt water pulse 1A event, where the sea level rose 14 to 18 meters in less than 340 years. It, and the rates were determined to be about 40 millimeters per year. And if you compare to present right now, the rates are only 3.1 millimeters per year. So there can be these types of events and we are talking here in century scale events, which could cause sea level rise of up to a few tens of meters as well. And what happened at that time? Basically 1.5 to three Greenland ice sheet melted and added the water uh, to the ocean basically. So, so thus understanding the vulnerability of these ice sheets is really important. But can we look at like even higher resolution? So this is 
if we, if we talk about present, we will not talk about centuries. What's probably more important is few next years or few decades. So what we also found, uh, we found we worked in Gulf of Mexico as well, and we found this phenomena there as well. But how does this phenomena look in coral reefs? So this is just uh, an example that if there is a, a rapid sea level rise, the reef margin just backsteps because there is a stress on the system. And we saw this in Gulf of Mexico as well, where this reef is 67 meters below sea level. Again, this is a dead reef. And uh, the exposed base is 85 meters. And what you see are these steps. So these steps indicate that there was stress on the system and the reefs backstep. Uh, so what you can also do is make some hypsometric curves, which shows these peaks represented by these steps. And in Gulf of Mexico, we found several of these islands and, uh, and uh, developed uh, these, these plots in which common terraces were identified in all of these reefs, indicating similar cause for the, uh, for the uh, development of these terraces. And we overlaid that on top of a sea level record from past, uh, 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 since the last glacial maxima. Here the time period is from 11.0 to 16.0 uh, kilo years before present. And what is seen here is that there are these six terraces which develop within these 2000 years of time span, indicating that there could have been decadal scale uh, events raising sea, later, uh, sea level up to a meter or two in a very fast, uh, uh, in, a, in a very fast manner. So this is talking about these very small scale events and like large scale events as well, decadal to century scale as well. But uh, what can we also learn from sea level of the past and the warm climate as well? So this was recently, a few years ago, published in Science. And this study uh, gives a clear indication of how the carbon dioxide, the global temperature, and sea levels are interlinked. And we still don't understand it fully, uh, uh, the vulnerability and, and how it varies. So to start, if we look at the first bar, it is present. And these are the two sides of the ice sheets. What is mentioned here is in 1819, the carbon dioxide was approximately 280 ppm, which we have increased uh, um, anthropogenic influence uh, to up to 400, more than 410 ppm right now, within a time span of a century and, 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 and a few years. So what has this caused? The increase of these greenhouse emissions has raised the global temperatures to about one degree Celsius. But what is also interesting is that during the last uh, interglacial, that is when the sea levels were at present level, uh, what was also seen was that the temperature was similar, but the sea level was six to nine meters higher. So why is that? What controlled that is, is still a matter of debate as well. And if we look at the previous sea level highs in the rock record, what we see is that within similar temperature, and if we if you think about it, one to two degrees higher than present, the sea level was six to 13 meters higher as well. And there only one fourth of present Greenland ice sheet was present. So we have all this information, but we don't know what might have, uh, what might happen like in the near future, we always have uh, 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 like gradual sea level curves, but it, it, it is sure that there can be some drastic uh, uh, or, or a very fast event that one of them we show, uh, saw at the start as well. So what are we proposing? We are proposing to work in the Western Indian Ocean. We predict on, and we know from several of these uh, points listed here that this is the best location to estimate eustatic sea level rise. So what is eustatic sea level rise is how much component of sea uh, level is increased by the ice sheets volumetrically. So why are these locations important? So first of all, one is in Lakshadweep. That's what we are proposing to work on. And the second is Aparsis, where a lot of work has already uh, uh, been worked by uh, Stephen and his colleagues. So why are these locations important? Because first of all, they are quite far from the former ice sheets. Uh, and this is important because they reduce the effect of glo uh, glacial isostatic adjustment that is important in estimating the actual sea level rise and um, uh, fluctuation at that specific spot. 
And the next is that both of the location are tectonically stable. And, and also lastly, that uh, these are representing varied or wide variety of uh, uh, latitudes. For example, Lakshadweeps are approximately 14 degrees north and these Aparsas Islands, French Islands are 14 degrees south. Thus, this, these locations are optimal to study uh, how the sea level might have uh, fluctuated in the recent past to, uh, to have better uh, idea how it might arise in the future. So what are we suggesting or what we are proposing is to go in the Lakshadweep and Aparasis uh, Islands and, and uh, collect comprehensive and accurate records of sea level uh, as well as environmental and climatic changes at various time scales. So now how, how we are planning to do it. So the plan is to go and visit these locations in three different legs with ships. Uh, to visit Lakshadweep first in the first leg. So these are some drowned carbonate platform just north of the Lakshadweep Islands. And as you can see, this is some of the bathymetric maps, which goes from five, meter, five meters below sea level to approximately 500 meters below sea level. Uh, so what we are planning to do is to do an operation approximately 15 days to collect some multi-beam bathymetry as well as uh, uh, sediment eco sounders, high resolution seismic, as well as some sediment cores. So once this survey is done, we are already in discussion uh, with NIOT, with Dr. Ramesh, to be able to utilize their uh, this uh, WACS instrument to go and visit these sites and, and drill these specific terraces, which will give us accurate information about the time and amplitude of sea level fluctuation events that uh, develop these, uh, these terraces. Next, uh, this is Aparasis Islands. We are looking at Glorious Reef Platform. This is north of Madagascar. Here there are different data sets that have already been collected. So for example, on top of the platform, LIDAR was collected. So this is LIDAR data set. And um, uh, beside it, what you see is multi-beam bathymetry data set. And then on top right corner, you also see another multi-beam bathymetry data set. So here also you see these different steps. These are also representing different uh, terraces, which are critical uh, information providers about uh, how the sea level would have fluctuated. So we already have some plans, but discussions are required on where exactly to go and, and do these drills. And again, we are planning to uh, discuss, we have already started the discussion, but uh, to be able to use their WCA, uh, WACS uh, equipment. Next, there are these uh, other islands as well, just uh, uh, south, which are called as Suandi Nova. Uh, it's also near, these, these are also Aparsas Islands. Uh, near Madagascar. So here what you see is, uh, first of all, bathymetry data, and then A, B, C are these seismic data set, where you can see the same terraces at these different depths, 105, 80, 55. And, and the idea there is also to go to these uh, few sites and use WCS system and drill these as well. So there will be a lot of different challenges to this expedition, but the theme of the project is sea level and climate change, and it is amongst the most relevant, one of the most relevant uh, society relevant issues uh, that the scientific community in general is, uh, is facing. And uh, until present, the records from the West Indian uh, Ocean are not there. So, you know, moving forward with this project, this will provide the first record of past sea level changes. And it is indeed a unique opportunity to develop and strengthen the scientific collaboration between Indian and French researchers. So the plan is to submit a joint proposal in next 2022 uh, to French fleet panel uh, when they uh, release a call. Well, thank you again, everyone, for your, uh, uh, um, uh, for, for visiting this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have no questions, so we'll move it to the discussion and try to catch some of the delay by moving directly to the next uh, talk, which is again an Indo-French uh, cooperation in the, in the, in, uh, in which uh, relate climate, which is related, sorry, to climate variability and changes. 
and it is a common work between IRD in France and NIO in Goa. And I will give the floor to uh, Mathieu Longen. We can see your presentation. I don't hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, and now I hear you. Very nice. Oh, okay, I perfect. My... <laughs> so yes, um, I'm just going to uh, give you a, a brief overview of uh, the collaboration we have been developing with the, uh, the National Institute of, Oce of Oceanography uh, over the past uh, decade. So uh, the main topic we have been addressing is to study the uh, Indian Ocean climate variability and climate change uh, in, the Indian, so in the Indian Ocean region. And this collaboration is mainly uh, organized uh, between IRD, uh, the Institute for Research and Development, and the National Institute of Oceanography uh, in Goa. Uh, so several uh, researchers on both sides uh, have been involved, and also a lot of PhD students, uh, especially on the Indian side. Uh, so uh, why studying the uh, Indian Ocean climate variability and, uh, and change? Because the Indian Ocean is particularly vulnerable uh, to, uh, to uh, the ocean, uh, to uh, ocean variability. So uh, one of the first reasons why it is, uh, it's because the uh, Indian Ocean is a highly coastal popula populated uh, region uh, with about one third of the world population uh, that are gathered in this region and most of this population being located near the coastline. Uh, this is also, uh, as shown on the top right, uh, uh, a region that is highly vulnerable to sea level rise. So this is a picture highlighting the region that are uh, very vulnerable to sea level rise. And you can see that most of the coastline around the Indian Ocean are very vulnerable to sea level rise, including also uh, a lot of uh, Indian Ocean small islands. Uh, in addition to that, uh, not the, 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 the country bordering the Indian Ocean are not only uh, vulnerable to a physical change in the Indian Ocean, but also to biogeochemical and ecosystem changes, because a lot of countries bordering this ocean are uh, uh, very dependent on uh, fisheries for their food security. Uh, it is, for instance, the case uh, for, the, uh, for, for India, but also in Indonesia. Uh, and, uh, and other countries. And another topic that we have been addressing uh, is also the, uh, the, 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 the tropical cyclone. So how the ocean uh, influence tropical cyclone because uh, especially in the Bay of Bengal, uh, the region in the Indian Ocean are very vulnerable to tropical cyclone. Uh, for instance, uh, in the, the Bay of Bengal only host 5% of the tropical cyclone worldwide but 80% uh, of the casualties have been uh, reported in this region over uh, the past uh, four or five decades. Um, so uh, what happened, we build, we started in 2004 to build a collaboration between IRD and NIO uh, to, to, uh, to investigate uh, the issue of climate variety and climate change in the Indian Ocean. So the National Institute of Oceanography uh, is uh, the biggest oceanographic institute in India. It is one of the uh, 37 CSIR institutes. It has more than 200 researchers and about 100 staff support. And his mandate is to continuously improve uh, the understanding of the sea around us and to translate this to the benefit of all. Um, so this collaboration was actually initiated in 2003. Uh, the general theme uh, that was developed at that time was oceanography and climate variability and change in the Indian Ocean. Uh, this has been formalized in 2010 by the, uh, the signature of a memorandum of, of understanding uh, that, uh, that continued till uh, this year and that we need to renew. Uh, this collaboration mainly work through the long time visit of French scientists at NIO. Uh, so there have been uh, uh, a French uh, uh, visiting scientist at NIO almost permanently since 2003. It's not the case anymore for the past two years uh, because uh, of COVID situation, but uh, also uh, funding issues. Uh, and we had a lot also of regular visit of NIO researcher and also students uh, in France. For instance, right now we have one PhD student from India that is visiting my laboratory for uh, six months. 
Uh, so in terms of uh, results, uh, we have now eight PhD uh, students that have been uh, defended uh, within this Indo-French collaboration, and we still have three ongoing PhD students. Uh, we have more than 70 uh, co-signed publications between NIO and IRD since 2004, and a large fraction of these publications are actually uh, uh, authored uh, as a lead author that is uh, an NIO PhD student. Uh, the financial support has been uh, provided uh, a lot by IRD uh, that has been uh, funding uh, the bilateral visits, so the visit of Indian students to France or the, the visit of uh, colleagues from France to India, uh, but also the long-term stay that we have been uh, doing over the past 10 years. And uh, we also had money from several funded projects, uh, so uh, some Indo-French uh, funding through uh, IFCPAR, uh, some Indian project, uh, IMOST, and some French project like from the, from the Kness Agency. Uh, the main theme of research that we've been developing was first focused on the uh, uh, Bay of Bengal water cycle, so uh, more particularly the salinity in the Bay of Bengal to understand the reason, I mean, the, the pattern and the variability of salinity in the Bay of Bengal. We have been also working on tropical cyclones, uh, how the ocean is influencing tropical cyclones, more particularly in the Bay of Bengal, but also at the scale of the Indian Ocean. Uh, and then we have also been working on climate variability and more recently on climate change issue and their relation with the uh, ocean biogeochemistry and the primary production. So I will show you a brief example uh, of uh, our earlier uh, research uh, that were uh, mainly focused on the water cycle and tropical cyclone. And then I will um, give you a second example on the, on the next topics. So um, this work has been done through uh, two uh, PhD that have been defended, one French, one Indian. And as you can see on the top figure, uh, most uh, there are actually about 20% of the cyclone that occur in the Indian Ocean Basin. Uh, most of them uh, being occurring in the southern Indian Ocean, but as I, as I told you, only 5% occur in the Bay of Bengal, but they are, they are very, uh, they, are, they, they create a lot of casualties. So, so I give you an example, for instance, in Argis, which is a cyclone that occurred in the Bay of Bengal in 2008, there were more than uh, 100,000 dead, uh, 1 million homeless, and about uh, 10 billion of damages uh, uh, related to this cyclone. So we, uh, in the course of this work, we worked on the forecast of tropical cyclone, and actually we build a new statistical forecast of uh, cyclone intensity. So uh, as I show you on the bottom left, this is actually the forecast error over the past 30 years for the uh, existing uh, uh, forecasting system. And as you can see, there have not been a lot of improvement of the forecast of tropical cyclone intensity over the past three decades. So we decided uh, this forecast system were mainly using either dynamical forecast or statistical forecast uh, based on linear uh, modeling. And we decided to develop a nonlinear uh, statistical model for to forecast cyclone. And as I show you on the on the right, they have been using these nonlinear methods, uh, have been uh, have been leading to a, a strong improvement of the, uh, the skill by about 10 to 15 percent, depending on the basin considered. We have been also working on the, uh, the impact of tropical cyclone onto the ocean and, on, and how this ocean reacts, uh, feedback onto the cyclone intensity. So as an example, I, I give you actually the, the cooling, I mean, the, the surface temperature on, under the tropical cyclone Nargis as a map. And as you can see, the tropical cyclone Nargis act to cool the ocean surface by mixing cold water from below to the surface and also through heat flux. And this cooling under the tropical cyclone is actually shared. We have shown that this cooling under the tropical cyclone is acting to reduce the energy available for the cyclone and act to uh, reduce the cyclone intensity. So depending on the amplitude of the, of the, of the cooling, the, 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 the type of cyclone intensity will be more or less reduced. Uh, this is actually a more uh, a focused example uh, on the Bay of Bengal. And as I told you, the Bay of Bengal is a very fresh water basin. Uh, with very, very fresh water, especially at the Ganges Brahmaput mouth and uh, Ira Irawadi mouth, uh, that inhibit actually this fresh cap, inhibit the vertical mixing. So the cooling induced by tropical cyclone actually weaker in this region than in others. 
So we have been using a model uh, that uh, reproduces uh, accurately the cooling under the tropical cyclone as shown on the middle map. So this is the time evolution of the cooling under the tropical cyclone. And you see that the model is capturing relatively well the cooling under the tropical cyclone. And we have been showing that by using a couple model, a coupling ocean atmosphere model, uh, we have been assessing the role of uh, RC coupling onto cyclone. And we, we have been showing that this RC coupling is particularly efficient uh, to uh, reduce the cyclone intensity before uh, the monsoon, while this coupling is far weaker uh, to, to after the monsoon. This actually calls, when you use dynamical forecast, to use an ocean model coupled to the atmosphere to do this forecast, because the ocean matter uh, to determine the uh, tropical cyclone intensity. Uh, I just also give you a brief example, because this is now the main focus of our uh, research about climate variability and climate and climate change and their consequences on uh, the uh, ocean biogeochemistry. Uh, so uh, I show you here first some maps of uh, uh, trends. So on the top, it's the sea surface temperature trend observed over the past uh, century. And as you can see, the Indian Ocean is uh, one of the regions where the warming in the tropic is the largest, uh, considerably larger than the one that we see in the Pacific. Uh, and this warming is not only larger in the Indian Ocean, but also larger in the Arabian Sea uh, compared to uh, the other region. So uh, as of now, this pattern is difficult to attribute to uh, climate change in observation because uh, of uh, the limited uh, time, time spend that we have for observation. And we don't really know what are the mechanisms driving this warming pattern. In the same way, uh, the, the satellite indicate that there have been a strong sea level increase in the northern Indian Ocean particularly. Uh, again, the pattern that we get from observation are rather unclear because uh, of the aliasing by natural variability and some observation uncertainties. And we don't know much about the uh, mechanism uh, related to the sea level rise. And the last example I give you on the bottom is the chlorophyll trend, so uh, related to primary production. And you can see that there is a strong decline of primary production in the Arabian Sea, uh, but we don't know yet if it's attributable to climate change, and we don't have a very clear idea of the mechanism driving these changes. So the idea will be to work uh, uh, on the future climate model projections. Uh, in the Indian Ocean, so provided by the uh, couple model from the IPCC, but also from in-house uh, simulation that we are planning to, uh, to develop. So what indicate these uh, projections is that there will be a weakening of the summer and the winter monsoonal winds uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, these models also indicate, um, as shown in the middle panel, that there will be a large sea level rise uh, in the Western Indian Ocean, larger than in the other region, that will be related that, uh, to a larger warming, uh, as suggested by the observation. And finally, these models also indicate that, uh, I mean, they, they project a, a decline by about 20% of the primary production by the end of the 21st century, uh, along the uh, western arm of the Arabian Sea and at the southern tip of India, uh, which will likely have uh, very strong consequences on the ecosystem, uh, but also on, uh, on the, and so on the fisheries. So uh, this uh, topic about uh, the climate change variability and uh, uh, the, the, rush, the impact it has on ocean biogeochemistry is actually the future focus of IR, our IRD and IO collaboration. Uh, so where we'll study more particularly the Northern Indian Ocean physical and biogeochemical response to climate change. Uh, we will uh, try to uh, answer the following uh, qu general question. What are the mechanisms responsible for the Northern Indian Ocean response uh, projected by the model? What is the reliability, the reliability of this future production given that this model that we use have biases? So we'd like to assess the impact of the biases on the projection, uh, on the reliability of the projection. And finally, uh, we would like also to have some hints on the impact uh, of uh, these uh, physical change onto the biogeochemistry, but also uh, at a later stage on the uh, ecosystem uh, in uh, the Indian Ocean. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your presentation. I have one question from Dilsa Rajapani. He says the number of cyclones are more in Arabic Sea than the Bay of Bengal compared to earlier data. Do you see any reasons for that? Yes, I mean, uh, 
Actually, I mean, uh, the, that's also what the model indicates. So, I mean, the observation seems to suggest that, but the, observe, the model also indicates that, and it uh, can be attributable to climate change. Because the, as the Arabian Sea is warming faster than the Bay of Bengal, uh, this yeah. promotes, uh, this facilitates the occurrence of a tropical cyclone in the Arabian Sea compared to the Bay of Bengal. So, the, the, the difference uh, of warming rate between the two oceans, uh, the two, uh, the two ocean, may be responsible, to the, the responsible for the increase of Arabian Sea tropical cyclone uh, compared to the building. OK, thank you. So let's move ahead. Uh, now we'll have two papers on biodiversity and biology. And this session will be continued tomorrow. So don't forget to connect tomorrow also. I will sh skip uh, introduction to gain some time and give the floor to Petel Gizen. It's a, again a joint work between CNRS and Sorbonne University and many Indian institutions like IIC Bangalore, uh, uh, CSIR in Hyderabad, uh, Polar and Ocean Research Center in Goa, and Center of Atmospheric and Ocean in Bangalore. So Kettle, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madel. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you share your screen to check? Yes. So, yeah. Fantastic. It works. So I will shut off my mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. I do it again. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Oops. Okay, that should work now. Yeah, it's okay. working. Yeah. Okay, so um, as you said, it's the I will present some work that we've uh, been developing with uh, colleagues in India, and this deals with the well the title is a bit long but it deals with connectivity uh, networks in uh, the marine uh, ecosystems and the delineation of disconnected coastal provinces along the indian coastline and that use a similar method that we've seen before that is lagrangian transport simulations so just a reminder of the different steps that started uh, in 2016 to develop and to build this collaboration in marine ecology. Um, so it started with the first marine biology meeting in Bangalore and uh, we didn't know at all each other. And that was completely top down process because we were invited by CNRS and Sorbonne University from the French part and from by DBT and the, the Ministry of uh, Earth and of Science. In, uh, in India to meet each other. And at that, me at that meeting, um, I met uh, Karthik Shankar that had at that moment a PhD student and wanted to develop uh, similar um, questions that I was presenting. And so after that, uh, uh, they invited me in the summer school in marine biology and ecology in Andaman. And I received uh, the one, well, this doctoral fellow for short term visit here in Banyul sur Mer. And that's where we developed this work that I'm going to present. After that, we went on to uh, try to elaborate some more uh, constructed uh, research uh, through a workshop funded thanks to CEFIPRA. And last year, we submitted to CEFIPRA a project to study the vulnerability yeah. and resilience of coral reef system in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And it was accepted for funding. So we hope that after the COVID is over, we can really start the project. So the question we are uh, interested in is marine biodiversity conservation. And if we look at this map of the Indian coastline, we have uh, in green highlighted all the MPAs that have been already, uh, that are already existing in India, and there are 24 national parks and wildlife sanctuaries that include marine protected areas. And the question we ask ourselves, and it's a similar question we ask everywhere in the world now, is at what special scale should we uh, manage marine biodiversity protection? Um, 
taking into account the fact that uh, isolation has proved uh, isolated MPAs has proved to be inefficient because of connectivity by the flow. And why is so? It's because most of the marine species have a reproductive life cycle that includes a life stage in which they are in the in the water column and they, they will be dispersed by the ocean flow. So that's valid for fishes, but fishes can swim at the adult stage, so they can partly compensate for that dispersal by the oceanic flow. But that's also the case for all those organisms that are uh, really uh, living in uh, attached to a, an habitat, to an area, and particularly the one which are fixed on rocks or uh, uh, in the sediments, which are the benthic organism. And th for this organism, uh, this dispersal phase is a crucial phase because it's the only way for them to, to well, that's the moment in which they are uh, going to be uh, expelled from their natal home and they have to find a new home. And for the MPA um, design, it's a crucial issue because MPAs are, um, specially defined um, objects of management of biodiversity. So that means that if they, they are drawn on a map and in, in, that, in that drawing, the uh, species are not able to renew their generation, then the MPA can be completely inefficient because it will only protect some individuals for their life. But after that, there will be a decline of the uh, population inside the MPA. So the MPA, uh, size and location has to be uh, designed in order to ensure this regeneration, renewal of population. And that means uh, reaching the proper size or articulating them into a network. And that's what the drawing below is showing is how um, MPA connected between them through this um, flux of larvae, thanks to the ocean flow, most of it, for most part of it, um, are going to function together and will ensure the renewal of generation. And that's the special, and what we want to define is at what special scale there will be this exchange of uh, offspring of the new gener generation that should be the scale for MPA coordination. And that's supposed to know what is called connectivity. So I'm going back to the uh, oceanic circulation around the India Peninsula and showing that there's a striking feature in this uh, region is that the flow reverse between winter and summer during the two monsoons from east to west and west to east. And we thought, okay, is there a chance that we can define the scale at which uh, management will be doable? Because if it's the whole peninsula, then it's going to be more difficult than it's than if it's a uh, more um, focus zone, because that means that people has to agree on the management rules they will apply in their MPAs. So we asked ourselves, are there uh, scales with these circulations uh, that will be um, um, tractable for management? So for this, we perform Lagrangian dispersal modeling because it's a the current tool to estimate connectivity uh, between areas. So that means integrating the flow along time and then reconstruct tracts of particles. And I had a movie, but I think I'm going to skip that movie. It's not necessary here because you've already seen it one for the plastic. So it's a similar tool as the one used for the drift of the plastic. But in that case, those particles are supposed to be the larvae of uh, animals living in the ocean. So to do this first study, um, as, and we know it's not sufficient, but they were not the uh, ocean description at the scale of the habitat and the MPA that we are uh, in the end targeting, but we used ocean currents from the ICOM model, which is a global ocean model, under the period 2008 to 10. And this has a resolution that is quite coarse. Uh, it's about six to eight kilometers resolution, uh, 40 depth level. And we incorporated this um, let's say ocean uh, current 
uh, outputs into a particle tracking model in which we disperse naturally buoyant particles. And we know it's still far from the larvae because we should incorporate some behavior later. And uh, we, but we pay attention in this uh, work to the to cover all the release location along the coast. So we covered all the co Indian coast with release location every five kilometers, release timing every one hour during two seasons. And we track the particles during 50 days with a rather small time step to avoid uh, flying over the land, for instance, with this CMS uh, software. And by doing so, we hope to scan a bit what would be the structure in the, um, in the connectivity along the Indian coastline. So for that, we build up from Lagrangian dispersal modeling a population connectivity matrix that is by defining uh, polygons all along the coastline in which we will uh, release, so particle will be released, but also will count how many particles will reach that polygons and we build this uh, connectivity matrix from source to destination polygons, which can be the same and that's on the diagonal, you have the retention rate but that cannot be the same and that would be off diagonal terms. And we build this connectivity matrix for different duration of tracking, which will be the pelagic larval duration. So the life expectancy, the expectancy for living of a larvae. And so along the Indian coastline, that means uh, defining uh, 500 uh, polygons of 20 by 10 kilometers, so rather coarse scale as well and building connectivity matrix for uh, 10 days uh, sequence. And there were 10 sequence of 10 days per season and in the three years. And we uh, build the connectivity matrix for uh, four groups of pelagic lava duration. These four groups um, represent the different um, well, statistical uh, description of the pelagic larval duration we can find for the many organism that uh, has been studied in India already. And most of the organism lies uh, below 20 days um, pelagic larval duration, but some of them can exceed up to 50 days. And here are some results. So um, first, what looks like a connectivity matrix and the order of magnitude of the connectivity is important to have in mind. So that's the uh, one example of a connectivity matrix for a PLD from 14 to 20 days, and then uh, for 22 days to 50 days. As you can see, it's the log of the transfer probability that is shown on that matrix, and its value goes to 10 at the power minus five to 10 at the power minus three, which means that the transfer probability is very low, but it's the case for uh, organism at sea because they release a lot of um, larvae and they release easily a million of larvae per individual in the sea. So these numbers are balanced by high fecundity in the end. And um, what is important to see is that despite, uh, well, this uh, fecundity uh, compensation, let's say, still there are not so many connections along the Indian coastline. And this is the graph below that shows connectons and singletons, which is a network analysis of these connectivity matrices. Connectons is simply the number of non-null connections. And it's the proportion of the non-null connection that is shown. And you see it's below, well, it's 1% when you have very short PLD and it increased at very large PLD. But in fact, it remains rather stable from uh, two days to 20 days. And it's still around 1% of, uh, of the potential connections that are realized. And there's a strong increase after 22 days. And for the singletons, which is the number of completely isolated polygons, um, they first um, increase and then they sharply decrease after 22 days. So, which means that when you start to disperse, you start to connect, um, well, they, there are some connections at short scale and then they, um, oh. well, let's just skip this <laughs> for now. Uh, but the singletons are not really, well, it's just to show you that there are some connections that expand first and then they decrease 
uh, rapidly, and then they again increase. Sorry. Um, the most important here is that in the network analysis, we did a community detection. That means that we look for uh, the polygons that were more often visited uh, than following the connectivity matrix transfer rate. So in the schematic that is below, you can see uh, the different uh, polygons, the range uh, taking into account their connections thanks to the connectivity matrix. So the arrow depicts the, um, the, uh, well, the size of the arrow depicts the intensity of the transfer probability. So you can see thin arrows when the transfer probability is small and big arrows when it's big. And um, if you imagine uh, a walker that goes through these arrows and take the arrows uh, randomly, but only take the arrows, then it will stay in some networks. And this network, this uh, community will be highlighted in the schematic right uh, on, the, uh, on the right um, and define the community. So here, these three sites will define the blue community. These two sites will be the green probability the green community, and these will be a small community, in fact, in fact, singletons. Based on that network analysis, there were communities that were defined geographically, as you see, and the limits between the community are shown by this solid bar. And for each time a polygon was a limit of a connectivity, it was counted. So first result was to look at the number of InfoMap communities or well, communities that were defined with this algorithm across PLD and spawning season. Oh, something that I did not mention, but maybe you noticed, uh, the blue and the red are two uh, assessments of these uh, community numbers or connectants for the different monsoon. And as you notice, the blue and the red are not that different, but they have large error bars. So which means that there are larger intra uh, intra uh, seasonal variability than inter seasonal variability, which is quite unexpected when you think to the reversal of the flow. In fact, it doesn't change neither the connectance nor the number of communities that you can define. And this number of community decrease with PLD, as you can expect, because the PLD becomes bigger, the community becomes bigger, in fact, with longer dispersal. But at the same time, the coherence ratio, this number here, is decreasing when the number of community increase because it's less uh, difference between the connectivity inside the community and outside the community. What we wanted to know in the end, what was the location of these uh, disconnections between the community? And that's shown on that map in, the, in blue and red for the different monsoon. The location on the most frequent uh, breaks, or the, the location where most frequently a break was detected between community. And that was uh, done for different PLD range and assembled. So as you see, these breaks happens in the same location, sometimes uh, in the two monsoons, and that is the case here in the uh, Park Strait or in the north here, in the northwest. Uh, but uh, there can be some difference uh, between the monsoon or between the PLDs. However, uh, these difference are not uh, unexpected because you expect that for the different species, there might be different location for uh, separation between um, populations. And that was observed as a genetic breaks, a genetic barrier in for a few species, and that's shown on this map here in A, C, B, and D. These are different locations where breaks or difference in population genetic um, diversity, we say, has been observed for the different species. So we do not expect to have the breaks in the same location always, but we would like to find a common denominator to define where uh, to, to, to how to organize the MPA coordination. So after uh, putting together all the data, we propose to delineate four, four areas, which are shown here in pink, yellow, uh, purple, and green. That will be the scales at which there will be high connectivity within and low connectivity between. 
And that could be the scales at which to study more in deep some coordination of uh, managements. And if you look at this uh, community delineation, they do not exactly match what has been done before based on other parameters from the ocean, which can be um, some hydrological uh, parameters. And that's the, on the uh, map here on the right, the uh, magenta and the pink delineate two uh, ecoregions that were established uh, after compiling uh, temperature, salinity um, in the in all the ocean. So that was only delineating two areas. And the but they match better what has been proposed as ecoregion based on species inventories. And that is shown by the uh, black lines. So the black lines uh, divine, divide different ecoregions that were defined based on species inventories. So the interest of that method is that uh, it's less costly than going for the species inventories and it already uh, enabled to identify some splitting in the, in the area and particularly here in the south of India that seems to be rather uh, isolated from the west and eastern coast. So I thank you for your attention and I thanks uh, for the funding support of CEPIPRA, CNRS, CSI, CSIR and uh, EMBO that funded the short stay of the uh, doctoral fellow. Thank you very much, Katel. And we'll move to the last paper, which will be given by Bunia Sloka Baduri, which is on biocomplexity in the Bay, and he's from uh, uh, sorry, Institute of uh, Indian Institute of Science and Education and Research in uh, Kolkata, and his work is about biodiversity in the Bay of Bengal. Can you share your screen, please? Thank you so much, Manel. I hope the screen is visible. It is visible, and we can hear you. Thank you Go so ahead. much. Thank you. Um, in this talk, I'm going to highlight uh, why disentangling uh, biological complexity in coastal tropical ocean is very important. And that can give a better understanding of uh, critical ecosystem processes uh, that is completely linked with the uh, blue economy uh, uh, of uh, various countries. So. The examples uh, which I'm going to give is going to be focused on the Northern Indian Ocean and it is part of the uh, Bay of Bengal region. The importance of uh, coastal ocean in uh, human health uh, is very well known and uh, many of the ecosystem processes strongly controls uh, our needs and the, our livelihood. Uh, therefore, understanding Coastal oceans, particularly from tropical and subtropical regions, are really uh, important uh, from the viewpoint of biodiversity and beyond. Uh, one of the important aspects of uh, biological functioning is the is this microbial loop. You know, we have looked at it. Uh, you know, decades to go gone by. You know, the first one was proposed by Farouk Azam, and then this is a modified one by Alexander Warden, uh, published in Science in 2015. But we really do not know uh, many of these components of the loop in the coastal ocean, particularly in the subtropical and tropical regions. So for example, uh, while we do not have a clear understanding of the structure and function of bacterioplankton communities, uh, how can we define marine planktonic cyanobacteria, what they're doing in these kind of ecosystems? So I'll focus on these two examples uh, over the next few slides and trying to uh, convince you that Complexity in these groups are far more than we thought of initially, and uh, they are very, very important uh, in terms of the key processes that might be unique uh, going on in, in certain parts of the Bay of Bengal region. So when we talk about biocomplexity, we uh, tend to kind of uh, look at it from the perspective of biological communities but we need to understand it from the perspective of physical and chemical complexity of the coastal ocean and more so from the viewpoint of microbial gills. So, so therefore to uh, understand the link between physical, chemical and biological processes, uh, there is a requirement of uh, gathering both regular and long-term observations. 
and time series is a fantastic example of that i think globally there are numerous examples of how important time series can be uh, you know in in understanding the health and processes of ocean systems so one of the time series sites that we have been uh, we have established and monitored is located in the east coast of india um, in bay of bengal this is the sundarbans the world's largest contiguous mangrove ecosystem and it is also a uh, unesco world heritage site and a ramsar site uh, this particular ecosystem is very very important not only because of its biodiversity but also because of the unique uh, geochemical gradients that it uh, faces uh, for example here the freshwater flow can vary between 42000 cubic meter per second to about 120000 cubic meter per second during the monsoon season or for example the suspended particulate matter load in uh, the coastal water of sundarbans is very very high it can range from 200 to 800 mg per liter and uh, frankly speaking there is hardly any uh, penetration of light uh, under that scenario but nevertheless uh, photosynthetic production is going on at a pretty high rate in this uh, coastal water of the sundarbans so just like in any other coastal system here we have set up this time series site the sundarbans biological observatory time series it is close to the bay of bengal but it is also influenced by this uh, one of the big distributaries of the river ganges uh, the muriganga so there is a, a flow of the fresh water as well as the marine water and also there is the influence of the mangroves and also a little bit of the anthropogenic influences uh, so the time series encompasses all these factors into consideration when you are addressing questions of uh, biological complexity and this is typically how time series data would look like you you, you keep on monitoring and catch the snapshots uh, on it a weekly daily or on a monthly basis and try to understand how the uh, physical and chemical variables might be changing and how biological uh, entities can be responding to those kind of changes so i'll give you the first example uh, when you talk about the coastal tropical or subtropical ocean we tend to think that uh, diatoms are the main drivers of uh, uh, primary production which is of course but also there are uh, many planktonic uh, microbial communities in particular marine planktonic cyanobacterial communities which become very very important seasonally in certain times of the year uh, in the coastal water of sundarbans of the bay of bengal and in this case what we are seeing is uh, 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 looking at the communities from the viewpoint of uh, 16s rrna uh, sanger and illumina sequencing approaches and we see that the system is uh, dominated by cinecococcus and there are different populations of cinecococcus probably guilds of cinecococcus that have evolved in this place and adapted to this system what is far more interesting is that uh, the planktonic cyanobacterial communities can account for almost 10% of the algal production uh, in post monsoon season in this water so therefore this is very very timely because uh, the rich fisheries that is found in this water uh, has a strong link with the algal production if we take at this data and try to understand what kind of communities are there besides of course when you are saying cyanococcus population which are the predominant predominant uh, eco cyanobacterial member we see that in this water there are several noble clades are there for example scb1 to scb4 and also NSC1 and NSC3. So when we found those sequences, we wanted to understand, are these sequences very unique to Sundarbans or they are found in other coastal oceans? So here, what we have done is we have done uh, quite a bit of sequencing from other uh, coastal waters, for example, the South China Sea from the Monterey Bay and from the Baltic Sea. And we chose these areas, taking into account the geochemical gradients that may be persisting what we see is there is a clade 8 is there which is exclusive to sundarbans and this is a salinity tolerance clade there are two more clades are there which is found in sundarbans and also in the south china sea but this group lack the nitro reductase subunit b and of course the scb1 to scb3 which are found in sundarbans and of course and in the baltic sea so that tells you how big the geographical expanses are uh, of the coastal ocean. So from Sundarbans to Baltic Sea, you see very similar kind of gills persisting in the coastal water and, and performing key, key ecosystem processes. Uh, so 
when we found those uncultured sequences, we wanted to also link it that can we establish or say or isolate some of these sequences uh, in the form of organism, organismal culture. And we managed to grow one of those um, species, the Sinecococcus muriganga, it's a new species, and it is part of the SCB1 clade. Uh, what is very interesting about this organism is that it can grow across a range of uh, nitrogen sources, including in presence of urea. So you can see how it has adapted to the coastal water of the uh, Bay of Bengal. When we sequenced the genome of this organism, we found that it has got one of the most intricate urea metabolic pathways, you know, ever been found in, in uh, coastal Sinecococcus population. Not only that, the genome tends to code for proteins which are directly involved in flagella and pilus formation. So we can deduce that because the suspended particulate matter load is very, very high, therefore the, this particular Sinecococcus species can sense the uh, light intensity and go into areas or zones where it can uh, undertake the photosynthetic process. So this kind of co complexity that is there in the ecosystem is starting to become clearer. Now I go to the second example. I talk about the heterotrophic bacterioplankton communities. And here what we have done is we have again selected uh, several sites uh, representing the coastal oceans globally. We have the Columbia Estuary and the Delaware Estuary from United States of America, Geelong Estuary and the Pearl Estuary from China, uh, uh, Hangzhou Estuary of course from China and all the estuaries, the seven major estuaries from the Sundarbans of the Bay of Bengal. And we wanted to see what kind of heterotrophic bacterioplankton communities are there. We find that in Sundarbans, there are very unique uh, populations of heterotrophic bacteria uh, dominated by the Farmicutes. And these, their dominance seems to be driven by the mangrove vegetation that is uh, there in this system. Now, uh, taking that cue into mind, we wanted to get an understanding what other factors might be playing an important role in determining the unique functional bacteroplankton communities that we see in this region. And here, what we have done is we have tried to link the nitrogen data, the dissolved inorganic nitrogen data with the key functional bacteroplankton communities. One of the interesting thing that we see is Sundarban has a very unique signature. Uh, here we see dominance of gamma proteobacteria compared to alpha proteobacteria. This is very unique. This is the only coastal system where uh, we find this, and that is because of the predominance of, uh, of the freshwater flow. But we also found that uh, based on the high and low concentration of the DIN, we are able to demarcate areas in Sundarbans and, and link it with the functional microbial communities that are there. So for example, if you look at uh, that the trends of bacteroidea, or if you look at the trends of alpha proteobacteria, they seem to be strongly shaped by the kind of uh, profiles of nitrogen that might be there in the system. Uh, from there, we started to look at the metabolic genes and we found that a series of genes, for example, nitroreductase or the transporter systems, also nitride reductase seems to be strongly correlated with the dissolved inor inorganic nitrogen profile. And that seems to play a very important role in determining the distribution of the key heterotrophic bacterial communities that are found, which are unique in this ecosystem. Now, one important question that has been there in the uh, mangrove ecology research for a long time is that the mangroves leaves, the litter fall that comes out, what happens to the fate of this litter fall? Of course, a breakdown happens. And in any mangrove litter fall, if you look at it, the dominant molecules will be tannic acid. So, how does heterotrophic bacterioplankton or, or in general biological communities uh, respond to so much of this mangrove litter fall that is falling in this kind of uh, ecosystem? So, so to answer this question, we took a mesocosm approach where we actually brought in a lot of water from the Sundarbans and set up the mesocosm experiment. And we added a uh, lot of tannic acid into it and we monitored the succession of the functional microbial communities and also wanted to see how the breakdown of the tannic acid happens in course of time. Of course, we saw that in course of time as the experiment progresses, the tannic acid was breaking down into gallic acid and so on. Uh, not only that, this was also reciprocated by the changes or the shifts in uh, bacterial plankton communities. Uh, here you can see very clearly, we have got the control data set 
where throughout the course of the experiment, you have got the dominance of proteobacteria, but in the spiked tannin uh, mesocosm setup, we see that there's a shift of the uh, proteobacteria is happening and members such as bacteroidetes and firmicutes are starting to become a very important player. Uh, when we look at the key uh, functional genes that are there based on the metabolic profiling, we see that there are a number of genes, including the branch chain amino transferase and the glutamate synthetase. These are playing a very critical role in, uh, in uh, ensuring the dominance of the members of uh, pharmacutes and bacteroidetes. And that makes sense because when you compare with other global uh, coastal oceans, we saw that uh, that was a signal we are getting uh, from the Sundarban estuaries and surrounding the Bay of Bengal region. Uh, not only that, the effect of the tannic acid uh, enrichment experiment was also felt on the phytoplankton and zooplankton dynamics. And here, here you can see how in course of time, the delta 13 C values actually shifted uh, with the progression of the experiment, highlighting that heterotrophic bacterial complexity is very, very critical and crucial for cycling of carbon. And it can ultimately help towards understanding the estimation of rates and fluxes of carbon in regional seas and oceans such as the Northern Indian Ocean. Uh, I want to end out here and, and highlight that we have a long standing collaboration between our collaborators in France and India. Of course, uh, you know, we work in the area of ocean acidification, coastal ocean acidification and Bay of Bengal is one area where uh, uh, Understanding ocean acidification is a challenge, particularly using satellite technologies. So we work with our colleagues in IFRAMAR on, on that area, and we continue to do that as part of the uh, Global Ocean Observing uh, Network. Besides that, uh, of course, you know, uh, we were part of the team which organized the indo French School on Aquatic Microbial Ecology, which was held way back in 2007. And I dedicate this to Harvey Maru, who was a fantastic scientist and excellent uh, you know, a personality who brought in a diverse group of uh, scientists from India and France together to promote uh, aquatic microbial ecology research in, in the region. More recently, our team is involved with Daniela Zeppeli from Iframar as part of the Blue Revolution project, where we are looking at automation and artificial intelligence in benthic fauna research. This is something which is going to be very exciting, and we are looking forward to more exchanges with our collaborators and colleagues from uh, France. And uh, thank you all very much uh, for listening uh, to my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all the authors for their presentation and all the audience for the patients and the attendees. Uh, I just want to remind you that the uh, session has been recorded, so if you want to go back to any of the system, you can uh, uh, replay it back from the website. An important reminder, tomorrow the session will be starting on 9.30, not on 10, on French time, which is 14, uh, 2 o'clock in Indian time. I would just like to remind you also two uh, events, which are IEEE Oceans in February 21 to 24th in uh, Madras, and the CTEC Week will be in September 26th to 27th of September, where India is a ghost country. Uh, I think we can have some time for a short discussion. Uh, I just want to mention the difference in time scale between uh, marine technology and marine science. In marine technology, you can start working in one week if you agree on doing simulation. Cooperation is easy because it's one to one and the time scale can be very short. When it goes to marine uh, science, which means oceanography, that where you need observation at sea experiment, uh, then it will become a more long time vision because I think the planning for the ships are done several years in advance and the scale is different. Uh, just was counting that the whole budget of CEFIPRA can finance one month, maybe if we are lucky, of experiment at sea. 
So we have to find different ways. And I've seen in the success you have shown that uh, if you coordinate well ahead in advance, you can have a very productive uh, cooperation. And uh, hopefully in the future, more common expeditions, but that has to be planned long in advance. But one other way uh, which can be easier is the data exchange because you may have uh, historical data on one area. And as you see from in uh, global warming, uh, historical data is uh, an important issue. I know that, for instance, there is an agreement between hydrographic services in France and in India for sharing maps. And probably we have to consider something similar for oceanographic data. Uh, I would like to just to leave the floor now. Of course, we try to cover some of the aspects. We will continue tomorrow on the biological aspect uh, and also on the social aspects. And if you see something which is missing that uh, we, and of importance that we have to consider in the cooperation, so please uh, now you can all switch on your mics. Please try not to speak all together. It's open for all the public for either questions uh, and uh, and the uh, discussions. Oh, I have a long, long mail from. Okay, from just say that he's leaving. Okay. So if, if you don't mind, maybe I can say a few words. So I'm a colleague of Mathieu Langain, who presented. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm a colleague of Mathieu Langain, who presented our collaboration of India. And I, I want to say a few words on what could be, uh, in my opinion, a very efficient way to um, maintain this type of collaborations. Mm. I think in the academic world, uh, one very efficient way to promote long-term uh, collaborations is through a PhD students. Mm -hmm. um, it's through PhD students because generally, uh, well, first, the student has both guides from France and India. So the, the uh, research question is jointly designed. It's both of interest to the Indian and French partners. And also, eventually, you can hope that this PhD student would eventually get a position. And that's a strong relation of your, of your student that allows you know, to maintain the collaborations very long in time. So I would argue that uh, funding a PhD is not uh, very high cost, but it, it, it's one way to really anchor collaboration in the long term. And uh, what is missing a little bit uh, uh, in, you know, if you get, for example, uh, uh, funding, a PhD funding from India or from France, what is uh, missing is uh, some uh, environment funding for the travels between India and France. And for example, at IRD, so I'm going to speak to, about what we have in my, in my institute, we have some grants uh, which come, so where basically the idea is that the, the student spends half of the time in India, half of the time, uh, well, half of the time in France, half of the time in another country. So for example, India, if it's a collaboration with, with India, and there is already plan within the, the funding, uh, funding to pay travels every year. So uh, that doesn't really, that exists within CEFIPRA, for example, if CEPRA program, but within big uh, pro projects. I think, uh, you know, I don't want to say what if CEPRA should do, huh? but uh, also having uh, specifically a grant program through if CEPRA or through the a joint program of the French embassy uh, and, and uh, India uh, MOES would be a very nice way to promote collaboration in the academic realm. I, can, I cannot speak for marine technologies. I don't know if it's appropriate. So sorry, it's I was same, it's the same in marine technology. It's yeah. a, the, the problem is the same. I think just before that, you have also one step before is to have exchanges of master project because uh, uh, going one year abroad for a PhD is very risky. They may not be adapted. They will feel homesick. So if they go for three months master project or final year project, then they will test this, the system, they will test the food, and mm. they will feel more comfortable. 
And this is why in, in our growth project, we start from teenagers up to uh, academic exchanges. You have to start a uh, little bit earlier because a master of thesis is a low risk uh, for the student. I, I, I agree, but we pamper our students very well. I can cook a very good curry for them. <laughs> any other comments or any other topic? I mean, uh, what has been introduced by Jerome is also the global changing, I mean, the global warming aspect that is a common issue, uh, not only for France and India, but uh, all over the collaboration. And uh, he is pointing out this aspect, which is, I would say, newly coming in the cooperation, but more and more uh, important in the international collaboration. And it covers all our aspects. I mean, the monsoon changes, the uh, biology migration, all of them are uh, can be viewed under this umbrella. Any other comments from uh, our colleague? Anything you just say, oh, I would have, I missed that. I would like to see some contribution uh, to that. Can I say something? Yes, of course you can. Th th thank you, thank you, Manuel. I think we also need to explore um, uh, new subthematic areas, emerging subthematic areas, as I mentioned. I think uh, climate change, uh, sea, sea level rise, new nursing, uh, automation, sensor development, um, also blue economy. These are some of the emerging areas where, uh, you know, India and France can, uh, you know, uh, organize uh, in a focused workshop, uh, you know, bring together experts, exports from both the countries. Also, uh, bring the ECRs, the early career researchers. Uh, you know, that's something which is very, very important. Uh, and uh, try to exchange thoughts and ideas so that uh, frameworks can be developed from there and then uh, taken forward. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Any other comments from the floor? Don't hesitate. If you don't say adding, it, I cannot guess it. Sure. Adding to adding to that, you know, I, I also had two two more areas I think where a lot of work still needs to happen in India. One is carbon capture. So carbon uh, CCS and CCUS, uh, carbon capture utilization and storage, as well as geothermal energy. So these two are uh, possibly the areas where like still a lot of work is required and uh, cooperation in these would probably be uh, pretty good. And uh, just to make another comment, uh, thanks Manel for initially mentioning about, um, about the uh, uh, funding time periods and how these projects with ships takes. Indeed, it takes a long time. And uh, Stephen from Ifrimer, he has been working already a lot in the Indian Ocean. So uh, I was fortunate that, uh, that he has been involved already. Uh, uh, in the work and I've been involved in Maldives. So we have had these discussions from a long time, but I think this uh, India-France uh, Knowledge Summit uh, during the past three years had actually accelerated the discussion amongst us. And then we came up with this idea. And I think, you know, the following up on this next meeting in Madras, as well as the Knowledge Week in France will be a great opportunity for us to also uh, 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 discuss our ideas and, and, and discuss with the potential collaborators. So thanks again to all the uh, organizing members for all these opportunities to, to discuss more possibilities for financial uh, 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 contribution and collaborations. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, what we have done in the city, we just try to trigger contribution from Indians to, make, to organize sessions in cooperation with the ministries and uh, so we have many suggestions of topics, etc. Not all what uh, can be viewed. And uh, both embassies are very active to help us because, you know, on both sides. Well, I, I lived two years in India, so I know the, the Indian system. And I can tell you, you succeeded to have a system more complicated than the French system, which was not very easy to get. And our role is to make it easy for users because the uh, I mean the number of ministries uh, the topic of for instance if you take ifremer which is one institutions it has four equivalent institutions in india 
NIO and IoT, the mapping system, the, and, and so it's a, uh, it's not always straightforward to have one-to-one -one relationships. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, Professor Medel, yes. yeah. Yes, Dilshak. Dilshak. Yeah. Last, last, uh, yeah, last time we have formulated all the areas and identified the areas, yeah. but the, the COVID is the real culprit which has stopped the further progress. But even yes. with the COVID, we could uh, do this uh, ex exchange and this conference uh, very successfully. And uh, I should uh, congratulate you for uh, making this session very live. And, uh, Thank you. and uh, I would like to say something about the climate change. When I asked yes. one question, see, in Europe, you have fire and uh, here it is rain. And uh, so whether it is, uh, and again, uh, when I asked, there was an answer saying that it is due to the warming of uh, Arabian Sea rather than Bay of Bengal. But uh, mm. it may not be in, the, in this region at all because that is also reflected in Europe, Canada, and uh, other places also. So mm. uh, whether it is, how, how we will uh, come to a conclusion on uh, that climate aspects. We should have more studies on yeah. uh, with the uh, underwater uh, tools and uh, the, uh, different institutions should uh, team up and uh, that will be the uh, one solution. That is what I would uh, suggest in this. This is where sh sharing uh, experiment, having scientists on each, I mean, Moving a ship from France to India is a very cost, uh, and you will not move your ship from India to France. But uh, as you know, we have uh, French territories in the Indian oceans and they do surveys and they do many things. So cooperating at this level is anticipating the output. I'm not, I'm not aware of any uh, agreement for data exchange, for instance, oceanographic data exchange between uh, what is done in India and France, except for hydrographic maps. Okay, okay. And that's so already some agreement is there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. For, uh, for uh, maps, there is an agreement. Maps. It's okay. a MOU which already exists, and uh, both navies exchange maps and they make it available to public. I mean, you may be using a French map in uh, India and we may be using an Indian map in France, uh, okay. but not for oceanographic data, as far as I know. Okay. So any more uh, MOUs? Do you think that any more MOUs are necessary for uh, cooperation? I mean, uh, if you have the, a good data exchange, then uh, you can have two PhD students working on the same data set or something like this to uh, enhance uh, cooperation and uh, preparing future common sea experiments or future or new equipment. Uh, we didn't discuss much except in one presentation about autonomous equipment. And this is something that is moving ahead and uh, which will reduce the cost of observation. Yeah, thank you. Like Is there any other comments, please? Yeah, just going on the on the subject you just uh, raised about sharing data, I would like to take this opportunity to ask if someone in the audience has know if there's a good bathymetrical data for the coastal zone along uh, India. I mean, high resolution data because well. I know in Europe, it's an effort that has been started uh, only recently in the end, and it's only since 2010 that we have uh, good uh, LIDAR data for the coastal zone, which enables to better describe the habitats and, and there's enable to do some more precise modeling for this area. And now uh, uh, we are embarked in this collaborative research with, uh, with guys of um, the Indian Institute for Science to, to develop a special planning around the Andaman Islands, but uh, we don't know where to find the uh, high resolution data. And that pinpoints also to another question that is interdisciplinarity, that uh, how do guys from ecology or marine biology connect with guys from or 
well, guys or girls, <laughs> I'm saying, <laughs> of um, earth science to get access to the data they need to uh, plan in advance either field uh, work or uh, build some modeling for the coastal zone, I mean, not for the large oceanographic scale. Thank so you. I don't know. If the audience, maybe no one is able to help, but if someone know, is able to help, can contact me. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a hydrographic service in India. I don't remember the exact name, but where they centralized all the map. I know that India has a big project, which is not yet uh, in application for a high resolution survey of all the coastal zones, which is not yet mm. in operation, but there are, uh, I mean, Indian people, uh, Dilsha, what is the name of the center that gathers all the information on maps and uh, hydrographic? Do you know? I didn't, I didn't get you, Professor Manan. Do, do you know what is a, a Indian institution, I just forget the name, that will gather yeah, all that the... That is Surely, National Hydrographic Office. Okay. And th those, uh, they have also the, yeah. So I, I don't know what the high resolution means for you, but I mean, it may be high enough or not enough, but... Uh, well, uh, we're talking about hundreds of meters. Hundreds of meters, it should be in the normal standard. On the horizontal, 100 yeah. meters on the horizontal. Yeah. Yeah, that would be already good. <laughs> okay. Any other uh, comment or request? I mean, maybe just one comment uh, to yeah. answer the comment of Catel. Uh, to promote, uh, so, so you, you, you mentioned as well about uh, trying to promote some uh, interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. I think a good way uh, for this is to find uh, broad uh, research uh, themes. Uh, for example, uh, recently we, uh, there was a call for proposal in France uh, uh, on uh, extreme events. And uh, we answered that uh, call of proposal with a project of uh, marine, uh, marine heat waves. So marine heat waves uh, includes uh, both uh, the physical aspects of marine heat waves, uh, how they are going to uh, evolve with climate change, uh, the impacts on uh, uh, biogeochemistry, on ecosystems, on the fisheries, on fish economy, on the societies. So it's, uh, it's, you have, if you want to, to address such a question, you don't have the choice. You need to set up uh, one consortium which has uh, many, many disciplines in, in it. And uh, so maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's not a good thing. I mean, <laughs> we can discuss about this, but that's a good way, I would say, to uh, promote interdisciplinary uh, science. I totally agree with you, but uh, you've uh, noticed that in France it's already difficult. Let's just take two things, uh, mapping and fisheries. Mm. In uh, France, they may be in the same ministry. There are two different ministries in India which make when you go to building up a project and finding financing from several ministry, more complex uh, issues. Well, that, that's why having a yeah. dedicated call for proposal for a single funding agency uh, yeah. helps. In, uh, trying yeah, that's to... right. Mm -hmm. So trying to identify these overarching problems that's why I, I also uh, push climate change. I'm, I'm defending my own <laughs> research uh, area, of course. Uh, but you know, there, there are these general uh, general problems for which, if you want to address all the dimensions, not only the, the physical, the physics, but also the impacts on the ecosystem, the impacts on societies, you need to have a very wide consortium, and it takes a lot of time to build and a lot of energy. You're, you're totally right. I mean, uh, either uh, global warming or plastic pollution are problems that do not match neither in France nor in India the administrative structure. This is why they will require much more energy to set up, but they are important issues. And this is why also tomorrow you will have a session, full session devoted on the socioeconomical impact mm -hmm. because also, this is important, and uh, I mean, the goal is to reduce the socio-economic impact. Okay. I agree with you, but uh, I agree also that it is difficult and it's long term. So we have to be more, uh, I would say, courageous and put more energy to make it run. Yes. Any other um, comments? Uh, yes. 
Any other comments? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yes, Jerome? yes, go ahead. Jerome? No, no, I'm done. Oh, you're Jerome, sorry. <laughs> Any other uh, comment? Or any request? Okay, if not, I will thank you once again for your contribution. And uh, we'll hopefully meet you tomorrow morning, 9.30 French time, two o'clock Indian time, which will be the continuation of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you.